Halito, uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. Um, welcome to the National Congress of American Indians uh, Disaster Preparedness Webinar Series. We're excited to have you join us today for part two of our webinar series um, that is exploring the tribal disaster declaration process, how to access emergency resources when your tribal nation needs it most. Um, I'll be turning the floor over to our colleagues at NCAI's event team, uh, Naomi, to walk us through a, a couple of uh, housekeeping items before we get started. Naomi. Thank you, Kelby. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining our Tribal Disaster Preparedness Webinar Part 2. Before we get started, let's go over basic housekeeping items and expectations for today's webinar. During the program today, there will be a various stopping points where we will open the floor to a Q&A. However, until we reach these points in our agenda, all microphones will remain muted except for the panelists. Please also make sure your cameras are turned off during today's presentation to allow only speaking panelists to be on camera. So let's cover the details of questions and answers. After various sections of the conversation, we will stop to answer questions. These questions are gathered through the chat box. You can type your question in at any point and NCAI staff will gather and track them for the short Q&A section after the various conversation points. There will also be a larger portion of time for Q&A towards the end of the webinar. Um, during this section, we will welcome on-camera questions. If you would like to personally ask a question on camera, raise your hand by tapping the reaction button at the bottom of your participation panel. And then you will see a button that says raise hand. Uh, we, will, we will call on you and send you uh, a digital request to unmute your line. You may turn on your camera when you are speaking during the Q&A portion of the agenda. To mute and unmute your microphone, if you dialed in, you'll you'll hit star six to initially unmute your, your phone, and then you will use the uh, phone's mute button to mute and unmute as you speak. Um, if you want to, if you're using your audio through your computer, there's a button at the bottom of the panel with a microphone, and you'll use that to mute and unmute. Um, and the other way we will use, uh, <laughs> and the other way we use in the previous Q&A is shorter by entering your talking points in the chat. So enter your talking points in the chat or you can unmute, but that's only at the sections at the end. Uh, don't worry, we'll post all of these instructions in the chat box. Um, if you have any other comments during the conversation, they should be submitted through the chat box. Next, if you're experiencing any technical difficulties at any time throughout the presentation, please reach out to one of us in the chat box. We'll respond through a private message to get your issue resolved. We'll pause to answer questions and address comments momentarily after, after they've been submitted. Thank you for your patience and listening to these instructions. I believe we can go ahead and get started. I'll now turn over the floor to Mr. Robert Holden for our welcome. Uh, thank you, Naomi. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, before we go any further, um, I'd like to ask um, our friend and colleague, uh, Honorable Joe Garcia, uh, to give us an invocation. Uh, he's the spiritual leader and statesman from the Pueblo of Okeawinge. Uh, he served as Okeawinge governor, lieutenant governor, and councilman. He's also a former president of the National Congress of American Indians for two terms back to back. Uh, he served as vice president and area vice president on the executive board at NCAA as well. I'm privileged to introduce the Honorable Joe Garcia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert. And uh, thank you, number one, for all the uh, panelists for being here. Um, gives me a great honor to give the invocation for this morning. So I will do so in my native language. And we are going I'm going to head in country, no, I can't do my. There'll be a set of every man. I'm going to work out the sea pool, the second of the wind down on the moon. I'm by a down, maybe it can't find out in the pin, find out in the pin. I'm by no wait up in the corner. I'm by wait up down to the corner. Wait up out from the corner. Wait up down to it. Oh, farmer for it. Now to a new corner. Nobody added. I'm by no the sea pool, the second of the wind. And we're here on Monday. Pintai de 
In brief translation, I call upon the Spirit, the Great Spirit, the Creator. I call upon the spirits of our ancestors so that they be here with us today, that we have important things to talk about, things to solve, issues to solve, problems to solve, and that we come here together as a part of in the nation of this world. And we do so with respect. We do so with the spirit of brotherhood that we're going to work together, continue to work together so that we fulfill all the things that the Creator wanted our people to have, and that is to have a good life. And that it's challenging times with the COVID and the disease and all that, and then the natural disaster. But that's not what it's all about. It's what, what it's about is that we live to survive. We live to keep our cultures and traditions and our languages to keep them in survival mode always. And that we do this for the betterment of our nation and for the health and well-being of all of our people, all of our tribal citizens. And we do that with respect. We meet the challenges. But we almost always must remember we need to stand together. We need to invoke the spirit of our ancestors so that they, they be here with us. And if you pray to them, they will be here. They will come. And with all of that, we will be successful in moving our nation forward for the betterment of our people, our children, our grandchildren, and for seven generations to come and beyond. And that we do that with respect and honor. And we'll do that today with respect. A lot of good things to talk about today. And when the session's over, there will be a, a uh, brief benediction before we all depart. So thank you for the honor and thank you and have a good day. I will remain on online as well to take up and soak up all the information. Appreciate it. Thank you. Back to you, Robert. Thank you, Honorable Joe Garcia. Again, greetings. Uh, I'm Robert Holden, Chartar Chickasaw, tribal liaison for the Louisiana State University National Center for Biomedical Research and Training Academy of Counterterrorist Education. I'll be your moderator today for this webinar on the Federal Emergency Management Agency's Tribal Disaster Declarations Pilot Guidance. I want to thank the National Congress of American Indians for sponsoring this production. Uh, the NCAI working with tribal leaders was successful in 2013 in amending the Stafford Disaster Relief and Emergency Assistance Act that authorized tribal governments the option to directly request a presidential emergency or major disaster declaration. FEMA published the Tribal Declarations Pilot Guides in January 2017 as a resource, as a resource to tribes seeking to exercise tribal sovereignty throughout the declaration decision-making process. The NCAI is pleased to offer us webinar series beginning today uh, for tribal officials and presented by tribal officials along with federal officials who have worked for and with tribes in a dialogue format about their experiences regarding requirements as well as the considerations and cost effectiveness in managing a tribal direct disaster declaration. Um, by the way, if, if you're not familiar with the guidance document, according to the uh, government accounting office, the purpose of, of an agency to issue a guidance document is to explain new regulations, respond to stakeholder questions, and clarify existing policies and procedures. A guidance document may explain how regulations are interpreted by the agency, and until finalized, it's not a legally binding document. This administrative guidance comes under the category of advice and recommendations. Um, I believe we had a solid instructive session yesterday and based on the positive feedback that came in. Um, well, I'm not giving too much exaggeration over statements, but I can't recall where the comments came in so quickly and commendable as well. 
Uh, this cadre of presenters has much to offer, and the good news is we get a second helping today. Uh, without further delay, I want to introduce the stellar lineup of speakers with us today. Uh, Jeff Hansen, Nelson Andrews Jr., Teresa Greger, David Monroe, Norma Reyes, and Kelby Kennedy. Uh, with that, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce Jeff Hansen. Please begin, Jeff. You're muted. Okay, I think I'm good now. Uh, try that one more time. So, hello, um, my name is Jeff Hansen. I'm the Director of uh, Community Protection for the Choctaw Nation. Uh, under that role, I, I serve as the uh, Director over the Office of Emergency Management, the uh, Office of the Fire Marshal, and the Probation Department. Um, I also serve as the Vice Chair for the FEMA National Advisory Council uh, and uh, have been very fortunate uh, to serve in that role as the uh, non-elected uh, tribal representative for that group. Um, moving into my seventh year with that group uh, where we uh, address policy issues with FEMA. And uh, one of the things that I've continued to try to do is, is make sure that the issues in Indian country are uh, addressed and um, uh, taken under consideration when they are developing policy or implementing policy. Uh, and so we've, we've uh, got a lot of work to do, uh, but we will continue to do that work. I'm, I'm excited about this uh, webinar today. I think yesterday uh, was really great, and I think there's some even better information today. So thank you all for being here with us. Nelson Andrews, Jr. Uh, yes. Winikisa and uh, Katapatush, uh, good day and thank you. Natasuis, my name is Nelson Andrews, Jr. I am the Emergency Management Director for the Mashpee Wampanoag Tribe. Uh, our tribal nation is located on Cape Cod in Massachusetts. Uh, we've been in these lands for over 12,000 years. Uh, I also serve as the uh, co-chairman for the United South and Eastern Tribes Homeland Security Emergency Services Committee, and I am serving as the acting uh, interim tribal, submit, uh, tribal administrator for the Mashpee Wampanoag Tribe as well. Uh, prior to my, um, my career here with the Mashpee Wampanoag Tribe, which I am also a member of, I was um, a member of FEMA's Region 1 uh, Logistics Cadre, where I served as a Logistics Section Chief, and then I was on the National Incident Management Team as a, the Support Branch Director as well. So I come to you with um, close to 17 years of emergency management experience. Um, we believe that uh, in our tribe, it is critical for um, for all tribes, to, all tribes and tribal members to be self-sufficient and, and self-resilient uh, and to practice their sovereignty um, and able to support their, uh, their tribal nations, nations in the realm of emergency management. So, yeah, we look forward to uh, providing you all with some insight today and good to NCAI. Thank you for, uh, for this opportunity. Thank you, Nelson and Jeff, and now Teresa Greger. My name is Dr. Teresa Greger. I'm from the Epi Nation of Santa Isabel, and I'm zooming in for today's webinar in Payam Kawicham territory. Um, I am grateful to NCAI, uh, Kelby Kennedy and her team, and Robert Holden for the invitation to present and share some of my insights and experiences with all of you today. Um, I started working in the field of emergency management after um, the 2007 wildfires in Southern California, I helped form uh, the Intertribal Long-Term Recovery Foundation at the bequest of tribal leadership. Um, today, we have uh, 13 tribe member tribes on our executive board of directors from San Diego and Riverside counties primarily, but we outreach across the state and partner with tribes across the nation, as well as tribal entities that do um, emergency service work. Uh, I am, again, uh, very happy to be here, share my insights and experiences, and uh, I hope to um, help you all in your process and in your journey today. Ahan. Thank you, Teresa. David Monroe. Hello, everyone. 
Uh, my name is David Monroe. I'm calling from the lands of the Piscataway tribe today um, and want to acknowledge uh, the lands that we're on. Um, and then I want to um, you share how humbling it is to be on this panel with both the experience and, and folks from Indian country willing to share those stories. And, you know, this is something that's, uh, you know, put on by tribes for tribes. So I feel you know, really honored to be part of this and hopefully I can add a little bit of, of experience to, to your thoughts. Uh, so Robert, Kelby, uh, the whole team at NCI, thank you so much for the invite. Uh, hopefully I, I've been able to contribute a little bit um, to this. Um, January 26th, the president signed an executive order reaffirming uh, the, the federal government's commitment to a nation to nation relationship with each and every individual uh, federally recognized tribe. Um, we look forward at the Department of Homeland Security and all of our components to, to uphold that responsibility and serve you. Um, I've been with the department since 2014. Uh, I left the Morongo uh, Band of Mission Indians uh, in Southern California. And um, you know, one of the things that stuck in my mind of, of the you know, eight years that I spent with Morongo is, is that every day or you know, however many times I drove on and off the reservation, the, the main portion of the reservation, um, you know, the tribe has a sign out front and, and it, it's, 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 it's the tribe's, tribe's you know, logo and, and, it, and it, it says the Morongo Band of Mission Indians and at the bottom it says a sovereign nation. So every time you drive onto that reservation, you're reminded of the importance of sovereignty and self-reliance and for tribes to make their own decisions. And you know, hopefully I can share some points in when uh, you know, our, the, the Federal Emergency Management Agency and their team crafted this, this pilot guidance, integrated those, those things that tribes shared with us on how to make this, this, this you know, as Robert said, this guidance you know, to help lead to a rulemaking process. So again, I've got limited technical experience in the, in the FEMA stuff, if you will. Um, I like to say I'm a recovering emergency manager now, um, but, but hopefully I can contribute a little bit to that. So thank you for your time. Thank you, David. And now Norma Reyes. Yes, good morning, everyone. My name is Norma Reyes. <clears throat> I hope everybody's staying healthy and safe during this time. Um, I'm former uh, FEMA Region 6 tribe, Regional Tribal Liaison. I retired effectively January the 1st, and I'm, I'm, I was asked to be a part of this panel, and I'm happy to share my experience and my knowledge during, uh, during the time I was with FEMA. I began my career with them, with FEMA, in 2007 as a Congressional Affairs Specialist. I assumed the role of Regional Tribal Liaison in 2011. During those years, I worked with 68 federally recognized tribes um, located in Region 6 four in the state of Louisiana, 23 in the state of New Mexico, 30 in, 38 in the state of Oklahoma, and three in the state of Texas. Prior to starting my career with FEMA, I worked as a program director with the Texas Department of Human Services, a special assistant to a Texas County Commissioner, chief of staff for a member of the Texas House of Representatives, and a district director for a member of the U.S. House of Representatives of Texas. Um, so so um, I look forward to, to this uh, uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Norma. As, as she said, she's just recently retired. And as my friend uh, says, uh, when you retire, you're not necessarily retired, you're actually re recycled. So thank you, Norma. And now, Kelby Kennedy. Uh, thank you, Robert Halito. Chim Chukma, Soch for Janusz Okfe, Hantalitu, Chatasi Ohoke, Chim Minte Yakoke. My name is Kelby Kennedy, and I'm a proud citizen of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. I uh, was born and raised on my tribal nation's reservation in southeastern Oklahoma, and now I work as a policy counsel for the National Congress of American Indians. Uh, one of the largest portions of my par policy portfolio is the area of tribal homeland security and emergency management work. And essentially, my job is to take the resolutions that tribal nations pass during NCAI conferences and help bring those to fruition. So whether that's working with Congress to pass laws on tribal emergency management issues, whether it's urging the White House to waive, for example, um, the cost share waiver uh, for tribal nations during a disaster declaration, or working directly with FEMA and the Department of Homeland Security on a variety of issues. Um, from firsthand experience, I know that tribal nations are often the first and only responders to natural disasters in Indian country. Um, as I said, I grew up on my nation reservation and I can distinctly remember several times uh, growing up on the reservation that my tribal nation was the force behind helping our people making sure that we were safe and, and saving lives and so my hope for this webinar series is that you can take this information and take it back to your people and help save lives in the future so I just want to thank all of our presenters here today um, I thought we had a very fruitful discussion yesterday a lot of great information and look forward to not just having a great discussion today but also having a great discussion for the 
third part of the webinar, which will come in March. Um, with all that being said, Robert, if you're okay with it, I will hand the baton over to Norma um, as we head into today's presentation. Norma? Oh, sorry, Robert, if you'd like to go. No, I just said please. Thank you. Okay, perfect. All right, Norma, you're up. Thank you. So um, the slide. Okay, so uh, to this morning I'll be kind of going over some of the criteria and uh, evaluation factors that FEMA kind of looks at when they're making a decision on, on the declaration. So for we'll start with types and amount of travel government costs and damages. What's really important is that you that in whatever you, the whatever you submit to FEMA that you clearly state all types of damage and the extent of the damage as much as information as possible. Uh, part of the things they're looking for is, is the damage that the, that the tribal nation incurred uh, is, oh, is beyond their capability in terms of it's overwhelmed the tribe. So at that point, they would need the federal assistance. They're gonna look at, so they're looking at damage to any tribally owned operated facilities like roads and bridges, water control facilities, buildings and equipment, utilities, Parks, parks and recreational, rec recreational uh, uh, areas, and any other any other damage that you might have identified. It also is going to look at the travel government's costs associated with, with the eligible debris removal and emergency protective measures that were that were put in place. Also, they'll look at non-Stafford Act eligible damages. So, um, when you're talking about damages, include all of that information and whatever you submit to FEMA. The other thing they're going to look how extensively were the facilities damaged, the estimate cost of the damage. Damage is damage located in a special flood hazard flood hazard area, if applicable. The percent of tribally owned operated facilities impacted, for example, 40% of tribally owned and maintained roads have been affected. So kind of give that percentage in there if you can. Percent of potentially eligible nonprofit organizations that may be within your, your tribal nation area and impacts to Indian culture, cultural and spiritual facilities. So that would be for the types of uh, and amounts of tribal government costs and damages. Now for economic impact of, of the incident, you would, what are the economic impacts of the, of the disaster on the tribal community? For instance, uh, road closures, uh, wastewater treatment uh, closures, business closures, how did that impact the tribe economically. What are the economics, uh, economic effects of the disaster of the tribal government? Did you have to shut down uh, uh, in terms of uh, those type of things? The other thing is tribal government resources. Um, they'll look at um, in terms of the tribal government's efforts and resources, such as funding and staff that have been or will be used to respond to or recover from the event. They'll look at the demographics and employment of enrolled me tribal members. Number and percent of enrolled members, tribal members whose income below the national poverty level. Then they look at the 24, uh, 24 month disaster history. Um, it's like for instance, have, had you had a recent Stafford Act uh, declaration? The other thing is, um, were you, did your tribe have its own have its own disaster and didn't come to FEMA, or there's a state declared disaster that you were part of? of our tribal resources used to respond to those events and also assisted from other federal agencies to address disaster uh, damages. So basically you, you're trying to show history. You say you had uh, uh, some type of event, disaster event and within the 24 timeframe that would indicate that your tribe ha doesn't have the resource at this point because you've been overwhelmed already a few number of times before. So that's important information. You also want evaluation of previous mitigation efforts, for instance, whether mitigation effort, mitigation activities such as building codes, ele ele elevations, or retrofits decrease the damage from this incident. If you can put that in, that would be great as well. And then, of course, uh, whether pro uh, for program uh, federal assistance, whether programs of assistance from other from other federal agencies might more appropriately meet the needs created by the incident. So uh, have you gone to other, for instance, USDA, maybe might have something Corps of Engineer assistance from them, it might be more uh, effective for you. The other thing is they're gonna look at is it's insurance, the amount of insurance coverage of the disaster impacted facilities at the time of the incident, the amount of insurance coverage, coverage that should have been enforced at the time of the incident, damage located in special flood hazard areas, which require a mandatory reduction on buildings and contents. 
They look at the unique conditions that affect tribal governments. Uh, for instance, um, needs associated with maybe remote locations, access accessibility to food, water, and medical supply availability, and of course, cultural or spiritual considerations. And of course, any other relevant information that you think will help FEMA evaluate um, the damage uh, to make a decision in terms of whether to approve it or not. So that's for public assistance. So now say you request uh, individual assistance program as well. So there's a criteria for that, for that as well that they look at um, whether uh, they look at, it's, sim it's very similar to public assistance. They look at the demographics, they look at um, in terms of community, whole community, including older members of the community, people with disabilities, children and other people who have access to functional needs, such as individuals who have limited English proficiency or non-English speaking, and individuals with low income as they have a greater need for support during a disaster recovery, during disaster recovery. The travel gover government's uh, resources uh, will consider the efforts uh, that the government put and resources that the that the tribal government utilized. Unique conditions that affect tribal government, uh, for instance, uh, again, accessibility, food and water, medical availability in terms of resources, unique conditions for a tribal nation. Uh, the population voluntary agency assistance, did you, were you working with them, uh, with, with the BOAT and different voluntary agencies for assistance? Programs of other local, state, and federal agencies that you may have may be available and maybe we're not able to, to, to obtain. Travel government resources, like we discussed, unique conditions that affect travel governments. And uh, so those are primarily the things they will be looking for in individual assistance criteria evaluation factors. Again, it, it's important that you identify as much as you can any information you provide to FEMA so they can look at all this. Uh, so really, if you look at this list, it would be something you'd want to include in, your, in the letter that you might submit to FEMA in terms of uh, asking for assistance. Next um, slide. Norma, we're on the individual That's assistance it. That's slide. Correct. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's it. I thought I'm looking at another one. Thank you. That's it. <laughs> so uh, yeah. I wanted to share a little bit of my experience with both of these uh, with Choco Nation. So we, we've had a number of disasters um, that we have uh, either gone as a subrecipient to the state or as direct to, to the federal government. Um, the public assistance, as you can see, there's a lot of data. It's very objective. You can put numbers behind it. You can, you can, um, you know, give some calculations for that. The individual assistance piece is a little more subjective. Um, it, it is a challenge. Um, I, I think this might be the case in a lot of Indian country. Um, public assistance, you can get there. A any, any tribe out there can work through the process and get there and, and recoup the cost. When you talk about insurance, um, a lot of tribes are self-insured up to a certain point. Uh, they pay the deductible. Those deductibles for your insurance can be um, uh, pushed and, and get reimbursed for those deductibles. Uh, so there's a lot of avenues to get assistance through the public assistance uh, criteria. The individual assistance, on the other hand, is a little challenging. Uh, we've, we've faced this on numerous occasions where we would have uh, large-scale flooding across um, a large area, you know, our reservation is uh, almost 11,000 square miles, um, and we could have half of that uh, sitting underwater, which we have at one point. Um, a lot of individual homes were damaged, um, but the problems that we ran into is because we are so rural that uh, this subjective view that, that FEMA uses, uh, we had challenges getting an individual assistance uh, declaration. And in every case, we have not been successful with that. Um, they, it is subjective, but there are criteria that they follow and, and it, it is a state-centric approach to individual assistance. Uh, just so you know that on the front end, uh, they are looking at more populated areas uh, when, when they're running those numbers uh, and, and basing that. So, 
this is the opportunity and, and get an individual assistance is really, really important to, to uh, spell out as much data that you can for the individuals. Um, we, we've seen, you know, the, the poverty rate uh, within the, the area, uh, that's a big factor. Um, because we are rural, there is a limited availability of housing resources. Um, so those are big key items that if, if you can call those out when you're making those requests, I would definitely do so. But again, just, just know that individual assistance is probably the more difficult of the two uh, to get a declaration. It can be done. Um, and, and Norm, I believe there's one or two tribes that have been successful with that. Um, but I, it's not been a large number, but it, it can be done. And you do have the capability within your tribes to, to document this stuff and, and get that assistance for your citizens. Um, so that's, uh, that's all I have on, on the, the, the background there. I think we're going to turn it over to Nelson. Actually, um, Jeff, I just wanted to highlight really quickly, um, we, the Q&A is open, so we're going to pause uh, after each of these individual sections. So if you have questions for the individual sections, please put those in the chat. Robert and I will read them off to the panel. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat right now for this individual section, so no worries if you miss the individual section. We're going to have a larger Q&A section at the end, but just wanted to let remind folks that, you know, if you have questions, put them in the chat. We'll pause after each of the sections to, to answer a couple of questions. Um, and with that, um, I will do what Jeff was doing and turn it over to Nelson. Nelson? Yes. All right. Thank you, uh, Kelby, Jeff, and Norma. Um, so in this section, I'm just going to go over some, uh, some of the, like, the requirements for a request for a, an emergency declaration. Um, we covered um, a lot of this yesterday. I just wanted to get into a little bo bit more of the details. Um, Next slide, please. Yeah, this slide. Thank you. Um, so we'll go over. We'll just go, do a quick, um, quick uh, recap on what we've are pretty much already talked on. So the Sandy Recovery Improvement Act amended the Stafford Act to allow uh, tribal governments uh, the choice to either request an emergency declaration or major disaster declaration, independently of a state or, or to seek disaster assistance through the through a state declaration. Um, so. Basically, for your emergency declarations, you have this, um, you know, you, you now have this opportunity, you know, as a result of um, SHREA, the Center Recovery uh, Improvement Act. Um, prior to this, tribes did not obviously have, um, have this opportunity. And you may recall yesterday we, um, we touched a little bit about, um, about the Stafford Act and how it, it's primarily state-centric. Um, and over the years, tribes have, you know, attempted to, you know, re well, Tribal organizations like uh, through NCAI and USET, we've you know we've attempted to amend and we've submitted resolutions um, to amend different portions of the Stafford Act, which we are still uh, trying to do. But the ultimate goal would be to have you know our own tribal-centric act in place. Um, but this is one of the one of the amendments um, that you know that you know made it made it possible for tribes to have emergency declarations. So our tribe right now we're under a, a national presidential emergency declaration for uh, the COVID-19 pandemic as a result of this um, amendment. Um, so for an emergency declaration, uh, the tribal chief executive may request the emergency declaration through uh, the, the regional administrator. And you may recall yesterday when I was, um, if, for those of you that were on, that's the process that, that we took. Um, my, um, my tribal council had, um, had uh, voted to uh, declare a state of emergency for our tribe after I um, I recommended that to to our tribal uh, our tribal chairman and tribal council and from there we submitted a um, a request for uh, an emergency declaration to become a direct recipient under FEMA um, directly to our regional administrator which from there went on to the president um, you know to uh, to allow that to happen. Um, and this is just, we already went over a lot of this, so I don't want to get too much into the, into the weeds. This just goes through the, some of the requirements um, for, uh, you know, for, for that to happen. Uh, the chief executive may submit the request within 30 days of occurrence um, of the incident. So I recall 
um, when we were going ahead uh, to, you know, when we were making our um, our request, it wasn't it wasn't as simple as it sounds. You know, sure we submitted the the letter to the regional administrator, but um, we still had to get a lot of the nuts and bolts um, and everything in place, and that included the PA admin plan, like we discussed a little bit yesterday, the FEMA tribe agreement, um, and then getting everything else uh, set up in the in the PA process, which I'll get into um, shortly. Um, you also have to prove that the situation is beyond the capability of your of your tribal government. So that's pretty much when you're going to go at, go ahead and request for for this federal assistance. If it's out of your out of your hands, um, and for the COVID pandemic, um, it got, it had gotten to a point where you know we definitely needed the assistance before we, you know, before the the president had you know declared the national pandemic. We were already working, you know, like a lot of other tribes were. We were already you know, working towards, you know, providing for our community and our citizens. And um, we, we had realized that it was out of our hands way, you know, way before the, uh, before the, the president had declared it a, um, you know, a national emergency. But so we were taking the steps already initially to provide, you know, the resources, uh, PPE and any, everything that we could to our tribal members, um, you know, before we actually went ahead and, and requested uh, federal assistance. But in doing so, um, in being being ready, uh, we were the first in our region, but the the second in the nation to get the that um, that federal um, request in under this this current emergency declaration that we're under. Um, some of the additional requirements are um, confirmation that your, the tribal executive has taken appropriate action uh, uh, under tribal law. Uh, to execute the tribal emergency plan. So you may recall yesterday, um, Jeff had talked about this a lot about the uh, your, your tribal emergency plans. This is this is critical. I mean, just having your emergency operations plan in place is you know it, it's going to be one of the first steps that a tribe is going to need need to do um, in general. But um, a lot of a lot of tribal folks might not may not even know um, where to start. And this came up yesterday. Like, how do I how do we go about getting you know, our, our, our tribal emergency management or emergency preparedness department even started. Um, there are resources within uh, within FEMA. They'll they'll have a liaison available, such as Norma has been for Region Six, and such as Regina Morado is for for us in Region One. Um, they can help with getting your emergency operations plan uh, in place. So that's going to be one of the requirements before you know before you go ahead and uh, request the emergency declaration. I I will um, note though, if they typically will not want, you know, even want to see this emergency plan. They just need to know that it's been activated. Um, but it, it's critical that at least to have it in place so that you're, you know, so that you're actually following, following the, the compliance um, within, um, within the guidance and within the, you know, the requirements that are, that are outlined here. Um, you also have to, you know, within that letter, that initial request letter, you know, provide a description of a, uh, all the efforts and resources you may have utilized. So, for an example, for us, as we went ahead and used, you know, all of our all of our resources, all of our PPE, um, you know, we were, you know, we were utilizing overtime and, and, and funds that we were we were going into for the for the staff that was on hand to, you know, fill in our incident command system structure roles. You know, for another example, would be like security guards, right? They're out there delivering PPE to the elders and and helping give out um, food at the food pantry. Um, you know, that would, you know, in in doing things outside of their normal job description. So things like that you might want to put utilize for in within the description section um, of your of your letter um, when you submit a request uh, for the uh, federal assistance. Um, the types of assistance that are, uh, that are available under emergency declarations, and Norma, I believe, covered this yesterday, and they just actually went over this in the slide before this, um, public assistance, uh, only categories A uh, and B. So um, what we're working under now is um, category B for this emergency declaration for our tribe, um, emergency protective measures. So pretty much everything we're doing, um, submitting uh, reimbursement requests for non-congregate sheltering, folks that are in hotels that are homeless, um, you know, resources to, to support our emergency operations center and, and, and staff that are working remotely as well. Um, you know, like computers and you know, thermal temperature uh, scanners, things like that. Um, in any overtime, that's going to be basically your, your, you know, emergency protective measures. And then they already went over the individual assistance uh, portion of this, but it, it is rare, um, as they explained, um, uh, to get authorization of that under the uh, under an emergency declaration. So, um, yeah, we can go on to the next slide. Thank you.
So yesterday I went over and I covered um, some of the basic um, priorities for uh, the, the public assistance, and I'm not going to get too much into those, but I do want to uh, stop on a couple of them that were um, that were critical and hopefully uh, explain some some of the better um, a better avenue to take when you're um, when you're getting to these these certain points. So um, obviously, um, as we went over already, you know you need the you know your organization is going to need the basics, right? You're done GPMS. And we already went over the PA admin plan and how critical that is. Um, your FEMA tribe agreement and um, then applying for disa the disaster grant funding. Um, one, of the, one of the important portions of this that I want to touch on is acquiring access to the FEMA grants portal. Um, this, this held us up a little bit, and I, I noticed it held up some other tribes in, in the region. Um, just getting, getting that, that whole grants portal uh, figured out is um, – can be cumbersome. So what I what I've done is I've I've provided some some uh, quick guides and how to videos here. I'm not sure if um, NCAI staff will be able to, you know, share share these links with you. But the links I've I've shared below is one's for, one's directly to the grants portal and then the grants portal hotline and then there's a YouTube channel as well um, that that helps walk folks through. One thing we experienced and noticed where it was um, there there weren't really too many folks. Um, that were subject matter experts that were that were able to assist us on the um, you know um, the the PA side of going walking through this. So we had to basically teach ourselves um, how to use the grants portal. Um, and there's a screenshot there that just it's just showing some of our projects that in the portal and, and what it looks like once you uh, once you once you get into into the portal. So one of the first steps is you're going to have to create an account um, and set up your set up your profile. For the grants portal, but you'll receive an email invite um, to to do that, um, and then it'll walk you through all the basic steps. Some of the things you're going to need to do in your portal is um, you're going to upload like your PA admin plan, um, and one of the one of the things that we thought we were supposed to be doing that um, that cost us a lot of time, uh, probably a couple of extra couple of weeks extra time that you know we needed that were critical during during this whole process was we were we were um, under the thinking that all of our tribal departments were considered as our uh, considered to be our applicants. So we went ahead and, and created separate grants portal logins for every single uh, department um, director and, and department. So we made separate individual subsections within the grants portal, same way a town, uh, a state would do it for their towns. But so if you're under the same DUNS number for your organization, that's not necessary. Um, and that'll, you know, that'll hopefully save some of somebody some extra burdens. Um, uh, one of the um, one of the the steps, you know, in this the PA process is going to be to conduct an app applicant briefing. So um, we yesterday I had mentioned as well. We went ahead and and had that applicant briefing with all of our departments and all of our tribal directors, thinking that that was the the proper avenue to do, to take because it seems like this whole process is still set up uh, for you know for states. Um, we're basically just, you know, we're 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 paving a new way. Tribes are, and we're we're finding finding ways to do this. We had like the same thing we had to do with creating, you know, our our PA admin plan that was state centric, and we you know we had to work closely with FEMA headquarters to get that done. The FEMA tribe agreement. Um, you know, if 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 our tribe, if the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe didn't go ahead and and re request, um, you know, to become a direct direct recipient under this emergency declaration. Then I have a feeling, you know, a lot of the other tribes that are, you know, that went under wouldn't have as well within our, within our region. We took the first, the first leap and uh, got all these plans and got all the hard, the hard work out of the way. So now for future um, declarations, whether it be emergency or, or, um, or disaster decks, we, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll have everything in place. But um, it was easier, it would have been easier um, for, you know, for us to just go directly into the state. And that's what was being nudged toward us to do. But we wanted to, you know, to express our sovereignty and also to, you know, to get that direct assistance that we deserve from the federal government um, and not become, you know, just another uh, sub-recipient under the state, which, you know, don't get me wrong, it, you know, a lot of tribes have chosen to do that and it, you know, it may be easier for them because they don't have the emergency management structure in place or folks to do all of this extra work. And believe me, it's a lot, of, it's a lot more work to do. But um, in the end, you know, you have that direct relationship and there's a lot of donated resources that the federal government FEMA will provide for you 
um, with no cost share, uh, as well as you know other other things that you can get in a lot um, in a faster manner. Another quick example is in the beginning of our of our incident here, our Indian Health Service clinic didn't have um, didn't have anything. There were no PPE. There were there weren't any test kits. Um, they didn't have any anything to do any testing for COVID-19 for our entire tribal community. So because of our direct recipient agreement with FEMA, we were able to place those uh, resource requests in and get um, get our community tested. Um, those 2,000 kits we initially got are, are pretty much just now about to, about, about to run up. But because we have that direct um, agreement with FEMA in place, we were able to request all of the PPE for our, our health service clinic and um, and also all of the all of the testing needs. Um, and right now, a lot of that's still tying into how we're approaching um, the vaccination portion of things. But um, they have they have a handle on it now, and HHS is coordinating a lot of that with IHS. So um, yeah, so it's, if anybody has you know any questions or um, needs any additional um, assistance, I can be you know, contacted after this as well, or um, or answer some questions now. So hopefully this this helps um, helps guide some folks in this process. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Nelson. Uh, this is Robert Holden. We have a, a question in the uh, chat room. Um, I'll read this. What is the difference between an emergency declaration and disaster declaration? Is it important for a tribe to make these declarations at the tribal level, even though they might not be seeking a presidential declaration? Would anyone like to address that? Yeah. So I, I yes, well, the emergency declaration is limited in scope um, to uh, emergency protective orders. So emergency declaration is what they've done with the COVID emergency. Um, there have been other natural disasters where they've uh, done emergency declarations like uh, I, I believe Flint, Michigan with the water issue was an emergency declaration. Uh, what it does is it opens up the avenue for assistance for emergency protective measures. A major disaster declaration is, is the other way to go, which would open up not only the, the categories A and B, but it would open up the permanent work category. So if you had major damage uh, to a road or you had uh, a waterway uh, that was damaged, that opens up that, that funding. As far as declaring a disaster at the tribal level, even if you don't think you're gonna get a presidential, I, I always recommend to do that. Um, it, it does kind of depend on what your, um, uh, your policies are within your tribe. So for us, there is emergency purchasing policy. So we have to do a declaration to open up those emergency purchasing policies within our own processes. Um, we've also, I've been very fortunate. My chief has, has uh, agreed that because we have so many problems with individual assistance, uh, we implemented an individual assistance program to where we can do direct assistance to our citizens, but I have to have a declaration from the chief to open that avenue. And that, that would help us to go in and, and repair privately owned homes um, and, and do some of the, the individual assistance piece that would come from that. Um, so it, whether, whether or not you do it, I, I always recommend it because it does a couple things. It gets you in the habit of uh, going through the process um, so that when the big one does hit, uh, you, you've got that muscle memory and, and you, you know what you need to do. Um, so yeah, I would always recommend um, uh, declaring it at a tribal level regardless of whether you think you will go to FEMA or not. Mm. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, there's a question that someone had regarding um, emergency response plan. Can you speak to the ability to be able to go direct without an approved emergency response plan? They can still request and will help the tribe slash nation draft the plan if they don't have one. I'm, I'm not sure if the last is a statement or a question. <laughs> it's tended to be a question. So, I mean, I'll touch on it a little bit. So the I know, um, you know, so the emergency response plan is going to—it's something that you know that's required. That's what they—that's what they want want you to have. So basically, it's going to be, you know, your emergency operations plan. Um, you know, could will will fit the criteria for that. One thing I noticed is they, you know, FEMA did not 
ask to review that because they're assuming um, that you know you've already had this in place and with your with your regional liaison most likely um, you know throughout the years. But um, it's basically the activation of it before you you know you go ahead and, and make um, a request for for um, a direct direct assistance or or a declaration. Um, it's you know the criteria is going to be based off of whatever you know whatever your tribe feels is the you know sufficient for that for that plan we we had to get our our plan approved through our tribal council um through a resolution um so um it's got, they're going to vary based off of you know your tribe's needs but i don't know if anyone else wanted to jump in on that too okay thank you um I think this other one is in the, in the form of a statement, um, but I'll just read it anyway. <clears throat> I, you know, we'll, we'll touch on these and just food for thought. Navajo hasn't received an approval yet on their COVID declaration. They submitted an individual assistance amendment or other needs assistance to supplement lost wages payments to those receiving unemployment insurance compensation. So if, if I'm not mistaken, um, the Navajo got the emergency declaration, but they submitted for a major declaration, if, if I understand this correctly. Um, so yeah, they're going to be working through that process uh, to get those other needs assistance, which have to come uh, through the IA deck, which would fall under a uh, major declaration. Great. Um, if, if, you know, if, so, if, if I'm uh, misinterpreted or, you know, if we if you want more for clarification, uh, please let us know. But with that, um, we'll move on to, to the next section, please. Norma? Hey, Norma, you're on mute. <laughs> the forever, the statement of 2020. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, my role as a FEMA regional tribal liaison was to reach out to tribal nations whenever an event and it, uh, a some kind of disaster occurred. And part of it was to uh, make sure that everybody was fine um, for their un unmet needs and help them find those unmet needs. And the other is also to get, uh, get an idea from the tribal nation whether they were, if they were going to seek assistance from FEMA or through the state. So the first thing, and a lot of times at the beginning, my recommendation is do your internal preliminary damage assessments uh, as soon as possible so you have an idea in terms of how much damage we're talking about. Is it going to be the 250 uh, 250,000 damage amount, or what is it going to be? So um, once they, uh, so I give them that that kind of recommendation, and then and then I let them know when you're ready to to sit down with FEMA and let's I'll get a, I'll get our recovery people together along with myself and your leadership, whoever you want included in this, to start the discussions and answer any questions you may have. Whether you want, uh, what does it mean to go direct? What are the requirements? What are the, what is the lift in terms of what are you going to have to do as a travel nation to come direct to FEMA? And what, are, what is it like to be, go as a sub recipient uh, to the state of, of uh, to, to a state? So some of the things that um, I think for a tribal leader or tribal nation government to consider is, for instance, the tribal sovereignty is really important to some tribal nations. Um, I think to all tribal nations, really. Uh, so that's one of the things that I think tribal nations look at. Do we want to uh, do use our so tribal sovereignty and go that route? Or the other thing is, what's your relationship with the state? If you have a good relationship with the state, maybe you feel you'll feel comfortable going with the state because there will be less of, of, of administrative burden when it comes to if you go as a sub recipient. Um, so the other thing is administ administrative um, considerations. Many tribal nations already have grants and they do they do follow compliance with records management and auditing re requirements. So that because that's one going to be one of the things that you're going to have to be involved as well, compliance with you know records management and auditing and those type of things. So if you have not done that, that's the other thing you need to think. Is this something that we have the personnel to do that? Um, or would we be able to get that? Um, and also staffing. However, I will tell you. For, for FEMA Region 6, um, we had the, we had the, 
we had a small Pueblo in New Mexico actually come in as a major declaration back in 20, when the, when the law of 2013 passed. And they had seven people working the declaration and they were talking about millions and millions of dollars when it came to uh, project worksheets for reimbursements and they were able to do it. So it's possible any any size of a, of a staffing and a nation can, can handle this type of a, a disaster because FEMA will be there with you every step of the way. You will help you with, with technical assistance and any questions you may have. So that should never be, um, you should never feel that because maybe you're small and don't have enough staffing that you can't do it, you can. And again, FEMA will be there with you every step of the way. The other thing that I think a tribal, uh, tribal leaders and uh, and type of government look at in terms of the requirements of plans that you, you know, what what plans do you have to have we talked before about the tribal hazard mitigation plan where are you with that you have one already of course as everybody has talked along the way it says we recommend that you even though you may not be requesting a tribal, de uh, tribal um, declaration time soon look at having that that in place already because you can also if you have that in place you can apply for other grad programs with FEMA so that's really important you get to start that, that process. The other thing is administrative plans. There's going to be a few administrative plans that go with that and some of them are cumbersome, but again, FEMA will be there with technical assistance. So don't feel you're out there on your own. Uh, there's templates and those type of things. So that's another thing that, that as a tribal nation, you know, we discussed uh, with a tribal nation, those are some of the things you're going to need. And then um, the impacts, what, whether they're consistent with factors the FEMA uses uh, in terms of um, damage and, and economic and some of the other things we, we discussed before. The other thing is cost share. Um, for FEMA, it's 75-25 cost share. Of course, you can uh, request a, um, an, an, an up, uh, what do you call it, a, a higher cost share down the line after you've if so, much, so, many, so much money's been obligated uh, during the recovery. So the other thing, do you have the 25% uh, funding to be able to cover the, your cost share? The other thing is um, before and after and during fall disaster, and like I said, discussed before, FEMA regional tribal liaisons and regional staff are, are available to support tribal governments in decision-making. So that's what we're here for in terms of staffing, in terms of providing staff support. So those are the, kind of the things that when we talk when we talk to a talk when I used to talk to a travel nation with a recovery director, um, all this was discussed so that a travel leader could not then make a decision if they felt they could go direct or if they wanted to go as a separate recipient. The other thing that I think is important also, some states also provide a cost, uh, <clears throat> 12 and a half percent uh, cost. Um, they, they cover 12 and a half, 20, 12 and a half percent of the 25 percent uh, cost share. So that's important to some, so to some tribal nations. So a lot of times they may decide to go with this as a sub-recipient because of that. That means they only have to come up with 12.5% of, of the 25%. So that's another uh, discussion that we would also have with the tri tribal nations. But um, what I, what's really important is make sure you work with your regional tribal liaison and the regional staff and get, get as much information ask all your questions and ask beforehand, like what are the, some of the things that were damaged and are, would this be covered or not? So get all that, you know, kind of cleared away before you make your final decision. So that's it for me for, with that. So um, I'm not gonna go through this entire table, uh, but I, I did wanna have it here for the slide so you guys could look back at it later. Um, this is also in the, the uh, tribal pilot guidance, um, uh, so you can take a look at that. But as tribes, the, the, the good thing that we've got is we have lots of options, right? Um, we've talked about this several times is the ability to go direct, the ability to go as a sub-recipient to the state or as a direct under a state declaration. There's a lot of things that kind of play in there um, as far as what plans are required, you know, uh, are you going to have to have a FEMA tribal agreement, you know, um, and, and those kind of things. I say all that to say there are benefits and risks um, from each and every one of them. I, I will always advocate for a tribe to go direct. Um, like Norma said, 
you do not have to have a, a large capacity to, to get through it. Um, there, are tri there are tribes that have, have accomplished this with very little staff. Um, the FEMA technical assistance, I think, is, is critical. Um, we have had uh, many, many conversations, even during the COVID, uh, with FEMA Region 6, uh, with their staff helping us walk through this process. Um, you know, Nelson pointed out the, the, the grants portal uh, earlier. My first time on there, I, I was completely lost, and it was just a matter of picking up the phone and, and talking with, uh, with somebody at Region 6. The, the biggest thing that, that I think that I'll give you my experience um, from the Choctaw Nation. Um, FEMA Region 6 did not do this, but I know that FEMA will always try to push tribes to go under a state declaration. It makes it easier on them. Let's be honest. They, they want to take the easy route out. You don't have to do that, but I know that there are FEMA staff out there that will push you that direction. We've done all three, um, and frankly, we've been successful with all three. So I, again, would encourage you to go uh, go the, the direct route if, if that is what your leadership wants to do. Talking about some of the risk um, with going under the state, uh, yes, there is the benefit sometimes of the some of the 25% cost share being covered by the state. In Oklahoma, they cover 12 and a half of that. Um, so we, you know, if we did a big disaster, we might get a, a pretty good chunk of money back from the state. The problem with that is when when is the state going to pay? Once FEMA has allocated the dollars to the state, um, it, it's in the state's hands, and you it may be a while. I have a disaster that is five and a half years old now. Um, that I'm still waiting on $125,000 from the state for, because we went under the state. That's a, that's a substantial hit for a lot of tribes. And so was it, was it worth it going under the state? I don't know, um, but, you know, we're still waiting on money. So that is one of the risks of, of doing that. The other thing that we as the nation here have to take into consideration are local jurisdictions. Um, so if there is a large disaster or, or frankly even a small disaster uh, that we have received damage and uh, the local jurisdiction received damage, if you go under the state, the tribe's damages are calculated into the local jurisdiction's damages and will help them meet whatever threshold that they need to meet. Um, if we go direct, our damages cannot be counted toward the state. So there is the risk of potentially causing a local jurisdiction to not um, be able to meet their threshold. And so as good community partners, I have to kind of take that into consideration as well when I'm presenting this to, to my chief on, on what route he wants to go. Um, if we go under the state and they count our damages and that's what puts them over that threshold, well, that's great because then everybody gets assistance. Um, but again, you run the risk of you may not, you know, get paid in a timely manner. Uh, from the state. So just wanted to kind of cover uh, those issues. I know we're not, you know, we're not unique here in Oklahoma. There are a lot of tribes that have local jurisdictions that fall within their territories, um, but that, that was a, a big consideration that we have to uh, look at uh, frequently. And I believe now we're going to go ahead and pause for a short Q&A. So, Robert, would you like to cover the question, or would you like me to bring the question up? Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> ain't, ain't, ain't Zoom great? Um, <laughs> come in. Isn't there a required FEMA disaster declaration request form that is submitted in addition to a tribal letter or resolution from the tribal council reference, and it was referenced by the presenters. Yes, there is. There's a form that uh, that's going to be part of the of uh, that goes along with your letter. Actually, the form is the, is really the main request. The letter is more uh, telling your story to help uh, uh, get your declaration. So yes, there is a form that will be provided to you by by uh, the FEMA staff once you've made that decision. 
Okay. Thank you, Norma. Um, that seems to be it for right now. <clears throat> and as we said, as, as Kelby uh, said that previously, that there will be a larger uh, Q and A uh, session at the end of um, all of these sections. Uh, moving right along, uh, Presidential Declaration of Termination, David Monroe. Hey everyone, um, as I shared in my introduction, I'm not necessarily the, the subject matter expert on all of this, but uh, those folks, as Norma said, are just a couple phone calls away. Uh, for those of you following along in the declaration guidance, we're going to kick this section off on page 44, the bottom of that, with the, the Roman numeral X on the presidential uh, declaration determination. And in the upper left on that visual, I wanted to share, as I mentioned yesterday, you know, this, this this change to um, to the Stafford Act for uh, authorities to FEMA to consider declaration requests from tribes, um, you know, came came from a lot of tribes and then the National Congress of American Indians. And I so I just took a screenshot of their resolution that, that was that was passed back in um, um, in Sacramento in, tw in 2012. But I think one of the most important things to keep in the back of your mind that. The president has the authorities. Um, it's the sole discretion of the of the president to declare an emergency or disaster. Now that not only triggers some things, most of the things that we've been talking about or that you've been talking about uh, amongst each other is um, so, some additional resources, but it also triggers some some activities and um, things that FEMA can then do and provides funding for those things. And you've heard technical assistance offered quite a bit, and um, that's you know, one of the things that, that is opened up, but uh, once or if the president has make a de declaration and, and you kind of that part in between is, it's, it's not like the request goes directly from um, a FEMA office to the president. So FEMA has subject matter experts ac across all of these fields that help you contribute to this decision-making process. And um, FEMA provides a recommendation to the president to um, either uh, approve an emergency or major disaster declaration request or not to approve uh, the major uh, emergency or uh, the disaster or the major disaster declaration request or the request for an emergency declaration. So one of the key questions that you know comes up is you know hey has, has the president approved it or where is this at but uh, what I recommend is always keep in the back of your mind is the, the president's staff and the council at the executive office of the, of the White House works with FEMA uh, Homeland Security folks, um, you know, uh, uh, Homeland Security Council, Domestic Policy Council, Intergovernmental Affairs Office at, at, at the White House. I mean, all of these folks have some input. So the more that you can share your story, as Norma said, that that cover letter that you've you've executed your your emergency operations plan, which different than the emergency response plan um, under EPA's emergency. Re, um, IPCRA Emergency Planning Community Right to Know Act, which which is is another avenue in the preparedness realm, which we haven't even really really touched on on a lot in the declaration guidance. Um, but keeping those avenues of and lines of communication and sharing that story in that cover memo with the declaration request, you know, all the numbers and everything on the back of that, those will be included. But really, you know, emphasizing the importance of you know, and I've heard this from tribal leaders is you know the question you know posed to me you know. When we when we get into these discussions, is you know, show me a treaty where it required our tribe to provide a non-federal match requirement. You know, so so any of that stuff that you can make sure that you include in there, and keep in mind that you know, as it says on page forty-four, is you know the agency you know, provides its recommendation to the president, and you know in our um, effort to ensure that there's there's a nation to nation relationship and that we're open and honest with the activities that we're doing, you know. Um, FEMA will be happy to share you know, kind of what their recommendations are and where they are in the processes with each individual recipient or requester. So don't hesitate to, to reach out to, to us in those things. And I just want to make sure I've hit everything. Um, going back to, to yesterday, make sure that you ask us for anything um, you know, anything that you need, that, that relationship with those regional folks will help really navigate the process of, of the determination. I mean, this is really the process where it's, you know, is it a yes, is it a no? And then how does the, does the tribe pursue from there? Uh, and then, then in the next section, we'll talk a little bit more about, um, you know, if you, if you don't get an answer, we'll talk about that, that appeal circle that you see there on that slide. So uh, Norma, I'm gonna pass it over to you for any big major issues that I might've missed. So just one I kind of wanted to share is that, you know, um, after the preliminary damage assessments are done, 
in conjunction with a tribe, whoever the tribal leader appoints to work with our, with FEMA. They will sit, and once it's completed, they will sit down and look at, kind of share and compare if they agree on the numbers, the total amount identified of damage and the, and the, and the reimbursement, um, what the damage reimbursement would be. If it's below the kind of the, the minimum amount that's required, um, FEMA will tell you, are you sure you've got all your damage? Is there anything you missed? So you do get that, that kind of uh, uh, recommendation, go back and look, make sure you've got everything on there so that we can fully fully uh, evaluate this. So it's not like, you know, you, it's done and FEMA doesn't talk to you after the clear damage assessment and, and then um, a recommendation is made. They'll be working with you on that as well. So until the, the recommendation is made. So they do have that, they do, that's why it's important that relationship with FEMA, that you work with them closely on that. Um, I'm, I'm maybe I'm, you're, um, Robert, for some reason, your sound cut out. <laughs> the the wonders of doing uh, Zoom live. Um, I, I what I'll do right now is uh, quickly turn it over to see if any of our other panelists have anything to add. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat, so if anybody wants to add on anything um, on top of what David and Norma have shared with us, uh, go ahead and add it on here. Otherwise, we will start moving to the next section. All right, seeing none um, and not seeing Toby. any other. Uh huh. Yep, uh, I hear you. Th this is Robert. I'm, I'm sorry, I had just a little technical difficulty there. I'm surprising, right? Um, I, I just wanted to uh, touch uh, on something that Dave, uh, in, in Dave's section, and what he's talking about in terms of the uh, declaration process and, and, the, and the presidential uh, determination. And, and the basis for all of these policies and procedures, including this tribal declarations pilot guidance, is, is, is the government to government basis, it's tribal sovereignty. So on, in a, on a protocol level, always remember that, you know, the, the president, your, the, your tribal leader, chief, governor, uh, executive officer, whoever that might be, is on that, is, is on that equivalency level of the president. If you are a uh, head of a emergency management department or whatever department that might be within the tribal infrastructure, that's the equivalent of a cabinet status. So always remember that, you know, you have every right on, a, on, a, on that government to government protocol level to communicate with any and, and all of these officials. So don't ever let that deter you. And I know, you know, you don't want to get above or, or out of, um, you, you know, uh, be, um, you, you want to keep this within the confines of your tribal government infrastructure, but always remember that, that, that this is the basis for all of this uh, information. Thank you. Robert, one thing I, I would also add that I that I spoke about yesterday in relation to um, cost share waivers, and I and folks might hit on this again today, um, but I mentioned yesterday that you know the Stafford Act requires, or it doesn't require, but it says that um, the United States government can have up to 25% non-federal cost share, right? That's the ceiling that they can have for a non-federal cost share. It's not an automatic, this is going to be a 25% non-federal cost share. So I don't want tribal nations to walk away from this webinar thinking, you know, every single time there has to be a 25% non-federal cost share. Um, clearly there are avenues for tribal nations to have that waived. Um, it could be adjusted to the 90, 10% through FEMA or through the direct appeal to the president. It could be adjusted to 100%. It also could be, you know, that the president decides that there's going to be no federal cost share, right? So we saw uh, last week, President Biden signed a memorandum saying that um, the cost share, which had been 25% uh, cost share over the past year, the cost share had been completely waived. It was 100% um, 
federal federal burden uh, to to cover that, and there was no longer a cost share. So I just don't want folks to think that you know it's automatic. There's no getting away from the from the 25% non-federal cost share. As I said in the Stafford Act, that is a ceiling that um, FEMA is allowed to have under the Stafford Act. It is not an automatic assumption, and that could easily be adjusted. Um, it's just all about getting the right information to the right people. And, and as David said, there's no there's no tribal uh, treaty that says that there has to be a non-federal cost share for anything. And I think that's a really important point to have here. But with all that being said, I'd love to move us on to our next section about uh, post-declaration activities. And uh, I will be handing it off to, um, let me double check, uh, Teresa, sorry. <laughs> Teresa, your turn, go ahead. Hi, I'm just going to unmute. I really don't have a ton to say. I feel like um, a lot of uh, what's already been shared, especially by um, Nelson in regards to um, whether you get the declaration approved, um, you're going to have to sign a FEMA TAR agreement or a tribal authorized representative agreement. And typically they want your chief executive um, official to be that signatory on that. But it's really going to require a team of individuals who are going to be working um, and coordinating those recovery efforts. Um, and then as Nelson was saying, you're going to get access to the FEMA grant portal when you start um, putting in your plans because they want to approve those and see that you have a mechanism to administer um, the recovery and uh, the resources and assistance that are coming into you. <clears throat> and that process again is going to have steps and layers of approval. So the, the signing of that agreement is going to be really critical. And then from there, again, like Norma was um, st stating, and I can vouch for this, um, FEMA will be there to hold your hand um, and offer as much assistance as possible. The one caveat I would put on or put out there from my, um, my past um, experience uh, helping tribes is that sometimes those FEMA liaisons and coordinating officers sometimes change because they get reassigned or, you know, there's a lot going on that FEMA's doing. So you may end up working with multiple individuals um, throughout your um, recovery. Um, let's see, what else can I say? Um, I would also just state that <clears throat> um, making sure that you have a little bit of redundancy in your personnel so that it's not just one person's job to be managing, whether it's an emergency manager or somebody assigned to take on that role. I think it's best to have, you know, like I said, a, a team of people that are working together, um, tracking the activities, preparing the projects, you know, um, utilizing the portal and understanding how it works. Because I think that's one of the hardest um, uh, parts of managing a, a disaster recovery is that sometimes <clears throat> we lose people. Sometimes uh, councils have elections and then some people aren't there to work anymore. And you need that uh, institutional memory, that tribal memory and history so that your project can be successful and your recovery can be successful. Um, and I'll pitch it to Dave, he can add on or other um, members of the panel can add on as well. Thank you, Teresa. And Teresa, I think you uh, you hit a good point that you know Nelson and, and the experiences that Mashpee had uh, shared a lot of this with, with all of us. Um, so I wanna try and, uh, well, let me point us back to where we're at in our, um, in the declaration guidance. Uh, we're on page 46 and um, you know, it talks about, you know, it, it addresses pretty clearly, you know, the elements that Teresa and Nelson addressed earlier, and we've covered over the past couple of days. Uh, but I want to share some, you know, kind of what, what drives this. So I, I took a quick copy of the section in, um, in the Stafford Act that outlines, you know, cost share adjustments for Indian tribes. And, um, you know, that's in the upper left of this visual along with a link. And you can you can just search for the Stafford Act as amended and, and that'll come up. But uh, where this comes from, you know, like how we established this criteria, you know, how did, did did FEMA come to these determinations of of this much damage, you know, this this much, you know, cost to a tribe, you know, this is what makes it um, less subjective um, of a determination of a disaster uh, is in that that subparagraph um, two down at the bottom that the president shall establish the criteria for making the determination. And, you know, that's where where FEMA went through the, the consultation process in working with tribes. Um, the, the appeals process that's established within the, the guidance um, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's, that's the last stop for a, a tribe. If, if 
if it ends up with an answer that um, you know it wants to work with the federal government on. Um, so I copied a couple or or just took two screenshots of Executive Order One Three One Seven Five, and. Um, Section six of that is written towards federal agencies, and it talks about increasing flexibility for Indian tribal waivers. So in addition to the waiver um, request or, or appeal request process outlined in the FEMA process, um, each of the federal departments, so this is the Department of Homeland Security, and then its components, FEMA being one of them, um, you'll have to establish this process for which Indian tribes can apply for waivers of any statutory or regulatory requirement and, and down at the bottom that's subject to the waiver. So, so if Congress wasn't specific and explicit in saying, hey, FEMA, you can only provide X, Y, or Z, or, or hey, Coast Guard, you can only provide X, Y, and Z, where there's um, a potential for a waiver request, this is where the importance of that communication with, uh, with your leadership, and, and I'll, I'll share some, some lessons learned later, but um, you know, I, I thought these, these two, two things were very important for you to be aware of and, and our activities, and then connecting directly to uh, the president's executive order on tribal consultation. Um, our department is ordered to within um, 180 days, I think, uh, I'm sorry, I forget there's so many requirements coming at us right now, um, to, to consult with tribes and develop our um, executive order 13175 implementation plan. So in the Homeland Security Emergency Services Management realm, um, you're gonna see our interests in the department's um, tribal consultation work plan to address you know, this type of thing is, you know, how do we make sure that a tribe asks for a waiver or, or that a tribe when it asks for a waiver and what is that appeal process and who has the final determination on that? You know, um, so so there's, there's, there's always other um, options and avenues. And the interesting part of this um, executive order without getting too dorky on things, um, and I'm by no means a lawyer, so Kelby could help out a lot more on this, but, but this is an executive order that was amended by Congress, which I think is really odd. I've never seen another one, doesn't mean that it doesn't happen, but, but this has full force and effect of law. So, so this increasing flexibility for Indian tribal waivers, although it's pointed at the department, this impacts Indian country and, and, and is an avenue for, for a tribe to make sure it's exhausted all of its processes. So next slide, please. And then uh, Nelson uh, highlighted the, the, the FEMA New Recipients Disaster uh, Grants Guide, uh, an important part um, uh, of managing you know, all, all, fee, all FEMA grants, all funding passed through, through the Federal Emergency Management Agency. And I wanted to highlight on the right, yesterday we talked a little bit about um, the Federal Emergency Management Agency's Emergency Management Institute and the tribal curriculum that, that Katie Kurt manages that a lot of you know. Um, so, or I'm sorry, Katie Hurt. So if Katie's on, you know, if she can set, put that link over in the, the, the chat, um, you know, that, that would be great. But I also wanted to take a quick snapshot of, of FEMA's just the page of the free independent study. So the IS means independent study, um, independent study courses directly related to public assistance. So these are courses just related to public assistance. And there's no, no specific length for each of these, um, but you know, most take an hour, two hours to get through. You can always pick up one or two things in these. Uh, they're free, go at your own pace. Um, you know, there's some training that you'll see some, some, some cast and crew that are on this call today who have supported some of that training and you'll see them in some videos. Uh, but this just requires a student identification and, and you know, helps provide some, some real important information. Um, and then in the middle, uh, as you look at you know, what, is it, what does it take to close out a major disaster declaration? Um, this is in a GAO report. I provided the link down there and you can just search for, for major disaster declaration process. And um, you know, I, I don't think anybody really prints out all of that stuff anymore. Um, you know, although, although 2013 doesn't seem like decades ago, but uh, if you did stack up um, um, all of the record keeping that you wanna make sure that you do for reimbursement, then I, th I think that's a pretty good picture. But I think you heard from, from a couple presenters is this is doable. And with, with the help from FEMA um, um, you know, and, and maintaining those relationships, I think that's, that's, that's a great avenue. So uh, I'm done and I just wanna click on the agenda. Let me see who I'm passing this over. Oh, Norma. Um, Norma, anything that we've missed? Sorry, thank you so much.
Sorry, Norma, you'll have to unmute your line. <laughs> we will be all ex we will all be experts at unmuting our line after this. <laughs> no, I did it. I mean, I was doing this is May 13th and I never got used to it, okay? <laughs> Up until I left FEMA. So anyway, um, so what happens after you receive a declaration? Uh, it's approved. In FEMA Region 6, when it was done, the regional administrator would call the, the chief executive to let him know. And then after that, I would do the follow-up uh, with whoever, um, for terms of getting the FEMA tribal agreement signed. The FEMA tribal agreement basically has to be done in order for, for FEMA to, to have a, uh, uh, provide any funding and those type of things. It's got, it's, so it's a pretty long process. Uh, a document, however, it's a, it's a, it's it's um, it's primarily already written. You just sign in different uh, areas, and you have to the tribal the tribal executive chief the chief executive will have to identify uh, different individuals from the tribal government that will be responsible. For instance, um, the president will uh, assign a federal coordinating officers going to lead the recovery process uh, for the disaster. So then the Chief Executive will then identify what we call a tribal coordinating officer. These two individuals will be running the show when it comes to, to recovery. And under that, you will, you will have people that will do the public assistance program, the I assistance program, and depending, uh, again, the tribe will identify their the counterparts to the FEMA people. Uh, it could be the same person because a lot of times, like I was saying, in one, in one, uh, for one tribe, the Santa Clara tribe, we work with basically seven people. And we have a lot more people, let me tell you. Um, so, and they, they, so they wore different hats to work the public assistance program and the different things that needed to be done. So that is done um, part of the FEMA tribal agreement. Um, at that point, also a discussion depending on the size of the disaster. Right now for, for COVID, because it was all virtual, there were no joint field offices. A joint field office, what it primarily is, is the FEMA uh, will work with the tribal government um, and identify a location where they, uh, the tribe, uh, tribal uh, officials and the FEMA officials can, can uh, work jointly uh, for, during the recovery process. So for instance, in the Pueblo of uh, Acoma, the Pueblo of Acoma identified a um, huge office space where we, we sent, we were 10 of us that showed up there. And that's the other thing, as a tribal nation, you, you can let us know because FEMA can overwhelm a state with the number of people we can bring in. So we definitely, for you as a tribal nation, let us know, for instance, uh, tribal Acoma says, we really don't want more than 10 people at our, at our Pueblo. So you do have that, that ability to do that. Uh, FEMA does not have to come in with all their people, um, just um, whatever you feel comfortable with there. And uh, so they, they could, we could join, uh, we would have our a joint office where we would work together and have our meetings together. And this way there was easy communication. Uh, it, can be, it could be something the Pueblo identifies or something that FEMA finds um, could be offsite the, the tribal lands. It just depends whatever the tribal officials want, how they want it done. And, and for instance, um, if say it's it's uh, the other option that, that we, if it's the tribe decides to go as a recipient, if the state works with the state to identify a location, uh, many times you can also ask FEMA if you can have a tribal member there uh, helping out with the recovery, like it, being part of the FEMA staff at a, like a tribal desk and participate in the recovery process as well. So, and that's important. You develop those relationships and, and you have daily meetings or every other, you know, twice a week meetings and identify, uh, discuss where you are in the process of, of, the, of the recovery. Uh, so that, that's, that's really important. Um, so also what can be done and is when one of the things that, that FEMA Region 6 does we bring in, for instance, I myself would deploy to a disaster and work the disaster uh, directly with the with the tribal nations and be the kind of the liaison for the for the for the rest of the FEMA team that was there. Uh, so I would have to leave. I would leave after about thirty days because I had to go back to the region. Uh, then we would deploy another tribal specialist. So that's something that's done as well. Is 
uh, it can, they deploy tribal specialists that will work. They'll be the liaison between the program areas and and the and the and the tribal government that's part, involved in the recovery. So um, basically, and also for FEMA Region Six, they've identified what they call a public assistance tribal team that's made up of three individuals that work specifically all tribal declarations, which makes it easy in terms of continuity. And say, for instance, when I would go back, we would bring somebody else that we felt would work well with the tribal nation. And if there were some issues, uh, we asked that the tribal nation call me so we can resolve them. And it's like, uh, I think someone else mentioned about the continuity. So your constant person for of, with FEMA in terms of, of um, your, your point of contact is going to be that regional tribal liaison. So always, if you're not sure who to talk to uh, during a disaster after everybody goes home, call the regional tribal liaison and they will get you what you need or answer your questions. So that's my input for this. I'm not sure who's next. <laughs> um, thank you, Norma. Uh, we'll proceed with the um, final section. Uh, I think we have post-declaration activities. We've still got um, a little bit to go. Is that correct? Because I see we're jumping over to Q&A. <laughs> so Robert, if folks would like to, if any of the other speakers would like to add on to what um, David and Norma just shared, we, we definitely have time. We've got um, about an hour left of the webinar. And so we have enough time for um, any additional uh, components here? Um, we'll head into Q&A after this and then um, get into some final thoughts. Um, I, I would like to add um, a, a little bit to uh, FEMA coming on to the, the tribe's reservation. Um, we have we have pushed FEMA through, through the National Advisory Council over the last couple of years to really start to look and be more aware uh, and, and culturally sensitive to the tribal nations. Um, they are making those efforts, but I think as tribes, uh, if we're going to uh, bring them on, um, it, it's good to let them know if there are any cultural um, norms uh, that, that they need to be aware of. I know FEMA, sometimes goes charging in head first and, and doesn't think about those things, but it, it is good to, to let them know. Uh, I know of some stories where uh, some uh, FEMA personnel were asked to leave um, because of some things that, uh, uh, you know, just were kind of out of the norms for the tribe. Um, so I, I think from, from a tribal perspective, we need to be cognizant of that, but, but we're gonna continue to push FEMA to uh, keep that at the, the front of their minds as well. So uh, I can kind of talk a little bit on that as well. Uh, for FEMA Region 6, uh, we provide um, a tribal, tribal kind of um, working with tribal nations and kind of sensitivity uh, kind of uh, overview and discussion with anyone who is deployed to the field. However, as we all know, once they're deployed, sometimes they don't they might not have listened well enough. And so that's why it's important. That's why you have those tribal liaisons in the field and the regional tribal liaison as well. If you see that something is not, it's not being handled correctly or uh, some female person is being offensive because uh, a lot of times they bring people from all over the United States. At one time, FEMA used to have what they call co regional cadres. Uh, of uh, reservists and they would come in. So they were familiar already with the region, with the, with the different states and work well with the different um, tribes and, and the state, um, state officials that they, however, that's no longer the case. So, um, so if you see that there's some issues, you know, we ask that you please let us know. And, and it, it, for us, it has happened. Um, I don't think it's been as, as common now. Jeff, do you think? I think we've improved, I think FEMA has improved some in the last few years. There's always additional improvement needed, but again, a lot of times you provide the training or the sensitivity training and you still have personnel that go out there and don't follow protocol. But um, that does happen uh, for FEMA Region 6, it's done whenever there's gonna be any tribal involvement in any of the disasters. 
So I want to quickly build on uh, both of the issues that Jeff and Norma have pointed out. NCAI has worked pretty hard over the last um, two years to really push the Department of Homeland Security to train not just all FEMA staff, but all Homeland Security staff, um, you know, because uh, DHS, you know, they, as one of the biggest agencies in the United States, interact with thousands of tribal citizens and hundreds of tribal nations on a daily basis. So we've really pushed to say, you know, you need to train every single full-time employee, part-time employee, and contractor to, uh, you know, understand tribal nations, to work with tribal nations because they will engage with tribal nations likely at some point during their job. And I'm happy to say that we were um, successful uh, at the end of 2020 in getting language in the uh, Senate um, or in the uh, omnibus legislation that went through, so the appropriations legislation. So if you look at uh, what's called the explanatory text, um, that's the text from Congress that accompanies appropriation language and that usually has directions to agencies about, hey, you need to do X and Y with this funding. Um, and explanatory in the explanatory text section for Homeland Security, there is a section on tribal consultation, and I'll just read it to make sure that I um, am accurate with what I'm saying. Um, so it has in there for the um, FY 2021 appropriations directing the entire Department of Homeland Security that within 180 days, the date of the enactment of the act. So the date, uh, the bill was signed by President Trump on December 27th. So DHS has until June 26 to do this. The Department of Homeland Security shall consult and work with tribes to update the manda mandatory base level tribal training course for all DHS personnel, including full-time employees, part-time employees and contractors who have regular interactions with tribal members or are likely to have encounters with tribal members at their duty stations. And so what that means is for the first time, uh, the Department of Homeland Security is going to have to consult with you uh, to train every single department employee on working with tribal nations. And while that won't fix the cultural insensitivity issues or missteps, I don't think folks generally go into these situations intending to insult tribal nations or to not understand. I don't think that that's the intent at all. However, there is a need to make sure that not just FEMA staff, but all Homeland Security staff have the appropriate training. And what this requires is that Homeland Security this year by June 26, have at least one tribal consultation with tribal nations to form what that training will be. Um, so really excited to announce that here and say that, you know, that was a, a push by NCAI and several other tribal organizations and tribal nations to start getting that and making it permanent. But I, I wanna make sure that as we're talking about, you know, the need to make sure that FEMA staff have the right information to approach and work with tribal nations, that on the horizon for 2021, there's gonna be tribal consultation on a mandatory training for all DHS staff. Uh, so <laughs> I know that was super intense, but um, Robert, I will turn it back to you to see if maybe there are other comments or questions, but I wanted to make sure that we mentioned that exciting uh, appropriation language uh, for uh, the department coming up in 2021. Thank you, Kelby. On that note, uh, yesterday we spent some time talking about developing relationships um, now as opposed to waiting until you know disaster strikes or get an emergency situation and you've got other things uh, in, in front of you but to reach out to everything from volunteers organizations active in disasters to surrounding jurisdictions fema other federal partners that might be involved and develop these relationships and you can also get a gauge of how uh, amenable they are to working with you what type of what what expectations as well as the folks that that will be um, in charge and that you'll need to work with in those areas. So uh, the time to do that is, is, is now. And um, we touched on that. We touched on, and I, I think uh, Jeff and others reiterated, have those plans ready um, on, on the shelf, uh, refine them, exercise them, exercise your plans, uh, do things of that nature. Um, I'm going to ask if anyone else might have uh, any from our presenters, our illustrious group of presenters, and, and just uh, uh, whatever you might uh, want to add at this time. Um, I just wanted to kind of touch on what, um, what Jeff and Norma had brought up and Kelby about uh, like FEMA officials coming on on the tribal lands. Um, I think it, it might have been through the efforts of, of the NAC and also through the efforts that Kelby had mentioned through the other organizations, you said and NCAI collaborating on getting um, you know these mandatory trainings um, in place. But uh, FEMA Region One um, 
It, they were under a, a new regional. We were under a new regional administrator over these past few years. So um, a few months before the uh, the pandemic hit, we had um, we started having technical assistance training from from FEMA and uh, different departments uh, from the region were, were coming out to visit our reservation. Um, and one of the um, one of the points that they wanted to uh, to address was to ensure that they had all of the checklists in place and, and knew of all of our cultural um, sensitive locations. So we, we went ahead and we made a specific plan, um, you know, basically that noted where, where everything was. I mean, and a lot of tribes may have an issue with that too, because, you know, say you have an ancient burial ground, um, you might not want to share that. Um, but um, it, it would, it with collaboration of your, um, your tribal historic preservation officer, um, and with uh, the FEMA regional office, um, you may be able to at least get some, you know, give them some guidelines because if there, if there is a disaster on, on your lands that may intersect, like on a checkerboard reservation, some state or or, or local lands, then um, all of that information and data is going to be going to be critical. You know, um, you want to make sure that you know FEMA actually has you know some some knowledge of, you know, where, you know, where your tribal lands even may end and, and where the, uh, the jurisdictional lands may, may begin, um, you know, to, to make sure that, you know, that your every, everything is taken into consideration so that your, your cultural sites or any historic properties that you may have are, are, um, are noted. Just wanted to add that part of it. Thanks. Thank you, Nelson. So Robert, we do have one hand raised for questions if we're, if we're ready to head to that section. Um, fine, go ahead if you will. Okay. Um, so we have a question from Victoria Flowers. Uh, Victoria, I, we've asked you to unmute your line and you're unmuted now. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, Victoria Flowers, Oneida Nation. I'm the Environmental Compliance Coordinator for the Oneida Nation. And we're in region five as far as how EPA exists. One of the things um, I'd like to encourage FEMA to do is to reach out to your other federal partners. EPA is currently in region five developing with tribes, working effectively with tribal governments. And I understand that uh, we're all very different, particularly in different parts of the country. But I also know that the Forest Service also has a working effectively with tribal governments program. Um, it would seem to me to streamline efforts and result in a more efficient, consistent exchange of information. If all the federal agencies were to look at what materials and what resources are currently being developed and used in trying to facilitate better partnerships between tribes and the federal government. So um, that's a great recommendation. I know that from my experience, just having left FEMA Region 6, um, FEMA Region 6 and uh, EPA uh, Region 6 group work well together. They attend our meetings. We attend their meetings virtually at this at that point. However, they whenever there was any tribal summits at the regional office for FEMA that we conducted, um, uh, we would have federal partners come in and EPA would be there. So that uh, one thing that happened was very positive. COVID was not positive at all, but however, I think in terms of collaboration between federal partners that for FEMA Region 6, it, it was really a positive situation because we had never really worked closely with BIA, with IHS and after and um, uh, USDA or the health Dep or Department of Health. But after for COVID, it, it became where we all know each other. We all learned each other, know each other well. There were daily meetings with them. So I think at this point, at least FEMA Region 6, there's, there's a great collaboration with federal partners. But you're correct that that should be encouraged for all regions. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. Um, go ahead. I'm sorry. Please. Hey, Victoria, and all. Uh, uh, great discussion. Thanks for leading it. Um, again, David Monroe at the Department of Homeland Security. So I'm the, I'm the individual who's responsible for carrying this out. Um, and I know this is a long history. I mean, this is this 
this stems from from as far back that I can remember, you know, in 2003, um, with the the tribal amendments to the Homeland Security Act and, and or Act, and tribes were asking um, for base level training across the department. Um, um, and and when I worked for a tribe, you know, I would I would uh, you know in working with federal partners, you know, I would ask for 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 their time in in, in these um, discussions. So. Um, I think one of the things, and I don't want to get out in front of the administration on any things that um, are going to happen with the White House Council on Native American Affairs, but the interagency uh, coordination for developing, you know, kind of how we frame it, that, you know, that awareness level training, the sensitivity level training, uh, the competence level training, kind of those tiers of, of different folks. And, and I think Congress is pretty clear um, that they're, they're um, interested in us working with tribes uh, to ensure that we have that that base level awareness training so um, you know what, what I like to share with our staff is so we don't do stupid I mean it's and it's it's nobody's fault and nobody has any intentions to do this and, and you know even if you look at you know you're not even elementary I mean you know I think oh, I I think primary schools I think they showed that only or only 13 or 14 percent of the curriculum across the United States has anything related to uh, tribal cultural considerations. So, so it's 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 moving a large piece. But then, if you 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 go to the undergrad and graduate level, um, you know, college students, you know, for an intergovernmental relations course, there's generally not more than two pages addressing tribal relations. So, so we understand we have a gap. We we want to to fill that gap. Um, there's obviously a uh, you know, new direction coming with a new administration. As soon as our new political leadership. Uh, comes aboard. Um, you know, this is already part of their briefing package. I shared with a couple of people in the private chat. I already have the draft, um, you know, engagement letter. Uh, this is this is you know something that the department's really interested in pursuing and and appreciate all of the time um, that regional folks take. And then so by no means will this take away from anything that you know those of us in your your on your tribal lands. Um, uh, you know, and, and working with tribes, you know, in those areas, but, you know, just the base level, you know, the 240,000 people across the Department of Homeland Security, an estimated same number of, you know, contract support, you know, so half a million folks, you know, to get that awareness level training. And, and your point of the federal government coordinating, um, you know, is one that was brought up uh, before with the White House Council on Native American Affairs, and I'm sure it'll be a discussion item uh, because you know, our secretary is a principal, so I'm sure it'll be an item of discussion as, as we move forward with this. So uh, uh, anything that comes to mind as we move forward with this, you know, I, I, I look for that, that collaboration and, 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 and con consulting with tribes and getting your guidance because we work for you uh, in carrying out our trust responsibility. So appreciate that and happy to hear any other thoughts or direct message me or whatever anybody needs. So thank you, sir. Robert, no. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Robert, uh, I'd like to add a few comments about the uh, endeavors that we're talking about right now, and and uh, the important the important piece of it is that um, during the uh, Obama administration, uh, you know, the 13175 was uh, ordered, and that's a continuous order that. Uh, President Biden has put in place. And one of the uh, biggest things that happened during the Obama administration is the fact that um, the White House tribal leaders formed uh, was implemented. And it was very, very, very successful. But the other part of it is that every department in the federal government uh, was also asked to put policies in place that talk about not only uh, consultation, but collaboration. And if there are any weaknesses out there in any of the departments that uh, when working with tribes, those got to be addressed. And that can only be addressed if you, if you truly consult with the tribal nations themselves, all tribal nations, not just one or two. And so I think that now is the opportunity to continue that, that, and I foresee that those White House Tribal Leaders Summit is going to continue or, or pick up once again. But the, the thing that we were able to work on, the big thing that we were able to work on during that time frame, I mean, the, the, the history will tell you that you, if you put a chart on success of federal government and tribal nations, 
you'll see the chart and it is going to be going downward, downward, up, 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 up. up. And during the Obama administration, you saw that thing skyrocket. That the, the sense of improvement and the sense of, of working with the tribe really, really happened. And so after that, you saw a big deep dip coming back down. So we don't want to go there anymore. A lot of good legislation has come about because of uh, the endeavors that were put in, in place. And, and as the prayer said this morning, we got to work together. We're in, all in it together. We're one nation. And so the nation, tribal nations, and the, the United States of America, we're all one line base. And so we got to work together. And when you talk about natural disasters or disasters just overall, we've got to find the solution together. It can't be one entity doing it because it's just not possible that way. So I foresee that this big endeavor is going to uh, make it happen once again. The good thing, the, the, the really, really important point is that we're only into the month of January yet. And President Biden is already moving forward with the initiative that were, took a long time. It was not even the first hundred days during the Obama administration, but he's already moving forward with this one. So uh, I hope that the tribal nations also take part in that. And I remember... I went to four of those sessions at the White House, and, and the uh, success of that uh, those sessions was just monumental. And so you you don't really realize it until you've seen it actually happen, where it start and where it ended. And so I think that's the important piece. But I wanted to add that to uh, the people that are on online, uh, be sure you talk to all your tribal leaders so that they be a part of this uh the solution that we're working on. But I thank you all for, for being on there. And um, David, thanks for being there for the uh, DHS. And uh, you've, got, you've got a lot of knowledge about the tribes. And, and you know, I wanted to say a lot more about, about training for the people that work with the tribe. I think you, you can't go wrong there, but you've got, to, you, you've got to find out, okay, who can teach that class? It's not like, getting a uh, if you're teaching math you got a calculus teacher to teach calculus you don't get an algebra teacher to teach calculus so in this case we got to find the right uh trained people the knowledgeable people and my hopes are that there'll be cultural um people from the tribes themselves that will provide this kind of training so thank you thank you joe um we always rely on your expertise and your experience in, in these matters. Um, in just a moment, I'm gonna ask, uh, go around the presenter room and to uh, we'll, we'll do a lineup of the presenters and ask them for final thoughts uh, at the last couple of days. But one of the things that Joe touched on was in, in, in Dave as well as the different federal agencies and their components uh, and, and the trust responsibility they have, as well as the executive orders and the consultation agreements, um, a consultation executive order regarding working with uh, tribal nations. Uh, each one of these has, has, may have a lot to bring to the table in terms of where you would, when needed in an emergency, emergency situation, <clears throat> excuse me. One is the Department of Defense. Um, there is a, uh, and each one of these agencies has an Indian policy. Um, and I'm, I always think of the Department of Defense as an agency, even though they seem to be far removed from day-to-day -day operations or, or relationships with tribal nations, they still have a lot of resources to bring to bear. And at times, you know, tribal officials have reached out to those installation commanders and worked out um, uh, how they might assist in these situations, as well as uh, the recognition of tribal nations, because many times they're on lands or of, uh, of traditional lands of native peoples. And so don't, don't sell yourself short in terms of reaching out and, and calling upon these folks because they do have a, an obligation to assist. Um, with that, I, I'm going to begin uh, as we did. Um, 
to go around the presenter room and, and, and uh, ask for their final thoughts. Jeff Hansen. Well, first, uh, Robert, I just thank you for your leadership. Uh, thank you for putting this together. Um, I, I hope I hope that um, there are many people on the call today that that are able to walk away with with something. And 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 I think if it were up to me, uh, the one thing that I would stress and and hope that everybody walks away with is uh, building relationships and and pre planning. Um, this is this is a difficult task. Uh, working with FEMA through uh, various disasters, but it's doable. Um, and it's all, it, it really, the building blocks for the whole process is really just working on the, the plans, getting getting the plans put in place and building those relationships, not only with, with FEMA, but also the other, the other stakeholders and departments, even within your own tribes, um, because there are a lot of resources that can be brought to bear. And, uh, you know, even if you never have a disaster that that rises to the level of a, a major declaration, that's that's great. But but doing these things now is going to prepare you for the for the for the smaller disasters as well, and uh, it, it will ultimately help to make the make each of our nations much more resilient. Um, you know, a lot of the things that we talk about in emergency management uh, are things that that the tribes have been doing for thousands of years. Um, we just call it something different. Um, so. Uh, just hopefully, uh, hopefully you, you, you all will uh, kind of walk away with that. That's my, that was my goal. So thank you all for the uh, opportunity and uh, uh, Yako Keith, Robert. Thank you, Jeff. Nelson Andrews, Jr. Uh, yes, thank you, Robert. Um, and uh, thank you all, to all of the NCAI staff, Katapatish. Thank you, Kelby, for helping coordinate this and you know, for all the efforts and um, and thank you to all of our all of our speakers and, and colleagues and, and Mr. Garcia for the uh, the invocation. Um, it's it's you know been an honor to be part of this. Um, we all are extremely busy right now with you know dealing with our, our own operations right and everything we're dealing with. We're in, we're still in the middle of our COVID response here. Um, you know, and our department is we're we're fully pretty much responsible for. Um, making sure that our community has all the resources um, on a daily basis, you know, from, from PPE to food um, and hotels for a lot of the homeless folks and, and everything else, um, in addition to supporting our Indian Health Service Clinic. So um, what, what you'll find is a lot of tribes are very limited in their staff. Um, and, it's, you know, it's an honor to try to assist other tribes that are going through the same things that, you know, that we might be going through. But uh, I think I would just want to leave everyone with um, as far as like, you know, the, the structure goes to everything we've been discussing for emergency management. Um, your, your main, your main structures that you're going to want to uh, uh, establish for your um, emergency management department, you know, are going to be, you know, ba the basic functions, like say that our, our state counterparts and our uh, county uh, counterparts may already have in place, um, you know, logistics section, operations section, planning section, in finance and admin section, those like those are the four four main um, structures that I've I've kept in the back of my mind since I started building this this department. Uh, my goal was to have um, have a department equal to to the state. Basically, you know, we're we're looked at from the federal government as equals, you know, but in reality, we don't you know we don't have that equality because we don't receive that direct funding assistance, that direct you know, the direct support, the same ways that um, the states get, you know, we have to apply for a minimal grant, small grants, um, and compete with each other, tribes, we're competing with one another for a small pot of money that states are getting, um, you know, on a daily basis. Um, I don't want to get into the weeds on it, but, you know, there's over $17 million a day allocated through Homeland Security funding to states. Tribes get less than half of that um, annual allocation. Um, I mean, that half, half, that, half of that da uh, daily allocation um, annually. And so, you know, we're looking at like a little over, what, $15 million that we get to compete from. So without the, that funding stream con continuously coming in for tribes, we don't have the same luxury as, uh, as states have, we don't, you know, where we can build those robust capacities where, you know, to have our own operations, logistics, planning, finance, and admin sections. So we're doing it all, all on our own if we're lucky enough to get the grant funding, unless you have a tribe that has funding to support that. 
departments. So one of the critical things will be to, you know, for your tribe to to work closely with your count, um, for your tribal emergency manager, whoever's in that position, to work closely with your tribal council to make sure that all the departments and, and um, different directors of departments are on board with learning the incident command system tru- structure, that training, that EMI is offering. Get that, get that um, in place. Take advantage of what's already out there. Um, get a person that's going to sit there and work on your planning, you know, your emergency response plan, your emergency operations plan, and um, and somebody who can write the grants basically and work on them. Because in reality, it's you know, it's it's going to be whoever's you know, whoever whoever can bring that funding in or get those grants going or, and and hopefully get that funding in is going to be the one that's going to be you know leading the way for your tribe. And it's also going to bring in other things such as indirect costs that can pay other admin duties and things like that. So um, there's a lot to this, and um, hopefully you guys learned learned a lot from us and we were able to provide some insight. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, and if there's any questions or whatever, I'm pretty sure that uh, Kelby or Robert can uh, relay them to us afterwards, but Kutapatish, uh, thank you all for your time. Thank you, Nelson. Teresa Greger. Thank you so much, uh, Robert, and to the co-panelists. Dave, it was really great to see you, and I haven't interacted with you in person in a while, so that was wonderful to hear, as always, your sage advice and um, learn more from your experience. Thank you, uh, Mr. Garcia, too, for your invocation and for for setting this off in a right way um, as we talk about these issues, because um, as we know and as we've all said and, and I shared uh, yesterday, you know, they're not going away. The, the the further we are from one disaster, the closer we are to the next. You know, that's what my colleague says, and we have to keep that in mind. Um, you know, my nonprofit deals regularly with 13 tribal nations, um, and it's, I feel like we're constantly in a, in a state of education and re-education, and that extends to our agency partners, um, whether they're federal, state, local, or private and corporate partners. Um, and that's one thing I would want to leave everybody with is to, as you are planning and preparing, to go ahead and reach out to those volunteer organizations. Try to build those relationships now. Again, you can use them for small incidents that may not be a a state of emergency or a major disaster. They may be single households, right? Just somebody struggling um, and build those inroads. Um, But it does take effort and it does take uh, tribal leadership to put disaster preparedness or planning or whatever you wanna call it in your community Um, on the same level as economic development, as healthcare, as education. Um, We need to have it uh, as a priority with somebody assigned to it from an executive position and then trickling that down to the, you know, the people that are boots on the ground. Um, I would just say that the panel is, you know, the experiences are phenomenal. Um, And, you know, just in my 13 years of doing this work, going from fires to floods to winter storms to severe drought, to now the pandemic, um, there's nothing we haven't all seen. And it's a testament to our uh, survivance as Native people um, in, in our homelands and in, and in, this, in, in the cha- changes that take place in our homelands that we continue um, to apply our knowledge and apply our kinship networks and our relationships um, so that we can persist, right? And continue to build that future for our people who are yet to come. So. Thank you so much for the opportunity, and I hope that you all walk away with some some good insight. Oh, my last thought, my last comment was, all of the plans and documents, um, the emergency operation plan or response plan, the hazard mitigation plan, when you start doing them, it sounds crazy, but it will start making sense. They all coordinate and complement one another are, and are going to assist you once you get going and you have a draft or something to work with let that be uh, the stepping stone for you to go on to the next level. So I wish everybody well, stay safe. Thank you so much, Teresa. David Monroe. Hey, um, yeah, I, f- I first need to just say how humbling this is to sit on this panel and um, you know, being an outsider looking in as you plan to this event to see the, 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 the quality of the folks that you couldn't invite to sit on your panel because of your limited time. Um, so hopefully I, I added some value. Um, you know, I, I feel re-energized again, um, uh, you know, and, and, and hope that we can make some, some huge strides in, in Indian country. And that brings me to, to kind of the one lesson learned um, that I, that I wish I knew that thing that I wish I knew years ago. And that's the power of sharing your word and sharing your story and making sure that the federal agencies that we're hearing that, um, the importance of a letter to a cabinet secretary, um, you know, 
it can't be understated. And, um, you know, I, I flash back, you know, another lifetime I worked for a city government and and in California there's 80 assembly members and there's 40 senators and and every week that they were in session I made sure that our little city because I manage our legislative program I made sure that our little city we sent a letter to each of those assembly members and each of those senators and then when we went for legislation to increase some sales tax for some recreational projects I mean they all knew who the city was um so I always think, and, and you know, many of us on this call, we've been we've been in these discussions. You know, the power of 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 individual sovereign nations bringing their voice forward in a letter saying, "Hey, Department of Homeland Security, you need to do X, Y, and Z." Um, and and that led that's led to a lot of 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 work. You know, since since the department was created in 2003, um, and we can even go back to um, I think it was Senator Inouye who introduced the, the the tribal amendments to to the Homeland Security Act. Um, you know, the act still defines tribes as local governments, and that was in Senator Inouye's you know, legislative proposal to fix that. You know, tribes aren't local governments. The department doesn't see them as local governments. Congress includes them there because we didn't have the right folks at the department to provide the technical experience to, to help get that changed. Um, so, so those things that you run into, and, and you know, recently you know, NCAI and other associations and tribes have been, been um, you know, proposing and something that, you know, and, and granted, us as federal employees, we shouldn't be dreaming up things for Indian country. And I always think back to you know, uh, the phrase, nothing about us without us, and making sure that you know, we're doing what tribal leaders want us to do. We're not doing what we want us to do. Um, but there's been this, 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 this recommendation that, that's part of my briefing material for our new deputy assistant secretary when, when he or she gets appointed. It was this base level funding for Indian country. Um, you know, I, I think it was Nelson who just mentioned the, the, the disparate, you know, expenditures that Congress is appropriating. And, you know, that's up to Congress of what they appropriate. But like I, I share with tribal leaders, I, you know, if, if Congress gave us, you know, $574 million and we had to give a million dollars to every tribe for their programs, you know, we'd be happy to do that, but we're stuck within the bounds that, that, that we have and what we can share. Uh, and that base level funding is, is, is based off of the standard that Jeff mentioned the other day, the emergency management accreditation program that yet that, uh, National Firefighter Protection Association, NFPA 1600 standard of what it takes for tribes to build an emergency management program. So as long as tribes tell their story, tell their story and tell their story, and I, I know I've, I've, I've stole that from a tribal leader, um, you know, that, that's how the federal government works. You know, we're just not gonna go out and do things that, that although we probably should because it's our treaty responsibilities. You know, uh, uh, back to my story, of, you know, I don't know of, of a treaty that says that there's a match requirement, but I also don't think that the tribal leaders, when they signed those treaties, um, or, or non-existent treaties or treaties that weren't ratified, um, I don't think that there was a thought that you know, this thing called homeland security would come and evolve and then tribes would be left out of it. So, so the importance of sharing those stories with our senior leadership and political appointees um, is, is way more effective um, than, than David Monroe can ever be because I, I I, you know, I'm not here to advocate on behalf of tribes. You know, I'm here to carry out what you tell us to do, um, but but you know that that's not my lane. And and so 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 any any assistance you need in that, um, you know, in, in 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 the world of emergency management and homeland security, uh, you know, sharing what's what's needed to, to be accomplished in Indian country to meet your homeland security efforts, you know, is, is so important. So really, that's all I have, Robert. So hopefully, I was helpful. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you for continued efforts, uh, Dave. Norma Reyes. Yes. Uh, well, again, um, Robert, thank you so much for reaching out to me. I'm no longer with FEMA, as you know, and um, I, I and I always say this to anyone, uh, especially when I decided to leave FEMA. I've had three great careers. My last one was with FEMA. And to me, that's been the best one that I've had, not so much because it's FEMA, but because I was able to work with, with uh, Indian country and tribal nations. I, I made many wonderful friends with, within, uh, uh, the, with the tribal nations and I loved um, working with them. And um, it made my, I was always happy at FEMA working with tribal nations. So I'm gonna miss that so much. So thank you for, for asking me to be a part of this so I could again be part of Indian country at this point, helping out however I could. Um, it's uh, one of the things I wanna leave you with is again, the tribal liaisons, region, region, the FEMA tribal liaisons are very important. 
for you, especially when you're working with FEMA. Please uh, develop those relationships. They are there to assist you with, with capacity building, with, with information, with training, whatever you need or any issues that you want resolved. That's what they're there for. Uh, so if anything, please do that. Please work with them closely. Uh, for me, if, I learned so much from, from uh, the, all the tribal partners that I work with. So um, it's a very, very um, fulfilling career that I had. So thank you so much. Thank you, Norma. Elby, Elby Kennedy. Hey, Robert. Um, you know, I, I echo all the thoughts of uh, everybody who's been on this panel and, and expressing my thanks. And, and, you know, thank you to the panelists for being here. I, there's so much great collective knowledge and on the ground experience, I think that a lot of people don't know of. And, and what I've experienced at NCAI is, you know, tribal nations need to hear from other tribal nations, right? Getting that information from tribal nations from across the country, um, especially as tribal nations are going through the COVID-19 pandemic, finding out what's happening in other regions. So, you know, um, right, if what's happening in your region is the norm across the U.S. or if it's something different, and if it's not the norm, then how can you, you know, work with your region to make it a better experience? Um, there was a comment yesterday or a question yesterday that uh, a tribal leader posed about, you know, if, if this is my first time um, ever, you know, looking at emergency management as several tribes have had to do during COVID-19 that may have never worked with FEMA before, where do I start, right? Where do I begin? And um, Jeff and Nelson both said, and I'll echo their comments from yesterday, that this is a great place to start. Um, there is so much information uh, that has been shared during this webinar series. Uh, we'll continue sharing the information during the third part of this webinar series in March. Um, there's some fantastic information and, and resources that have been shared in the chat that we will share in a follow-up email. And if you're watching this on the NCAI YouTube page later, please feel free to reach out to me for those resources. Um, my email is kkennedy at ncai.org. We're happy to share those resources with you. But um, you know, the first step is, is, is finding out this information taking the time to watch these webinars. Um, and then our hope is that you take the information from here and help prepare your nation for any future disasters. And um, I have to say, you know, at, at my time at NCAI that I've been here, I have learned so much from all the folks in the call um, and in several more tribal nations and leaders and emergency managers and, and uh, members of FEMA and Homeland Security. And I look forward to continuing to work on those really important policy issues that tribal nations have continued to bring up um, to the department, to the White House, and to Congress. Um, it's been alluded to by a couple of other speakers uh, of some items that NCAI and USET are continuing to work with Congress to get passed across the line to make it better for tribal nations working to grow their homeland security and emergency management capacities. So that uh, consistent capacity building funding that David mentioned, that's an NCAI and USET resolution to get consistent funding to all tribal nations every single year because for you know for the past 50 years, tribal nations haven't have consistent you know, capacity building funding like states have. And so we need to remedy that. We also need to make sure that tribal nations have representation within the Department of Homeland Security at a greater degree than what we have already. And so that's a reason that both USET and NCAI have resolutions calling for an assistant secretary of Indian Affairs in the Department of Homeland Security. Um, we've been pushing with the White House to get that uh, department uh, established because we need to have uh, a, an assistant secretary in the room with the Secretary of Homeland Security, making sure that tribal nations are at the forefront of everybody's mind as opposed to being the last thought before something's done, right? Um, I think some tribal nations have highlighted in past conversations uh, with myself and other members on the call that sometimes issues at the regional level, while important, sometimes don't bubble up to HQ. So making sure that your story is being told, making sure it's getting to, to the secretary, making sure it's getting up there is really important. Um, and then finally, I, I want to also point that there's another issue that, you know, in terms of tribal nations having a seat at the table that we believe would be a very big um, help in this policy space, and that's establishing a tribal advisory council in the Department of Homeland Security. Um, uh, ATAC, uh, as it's known in other departments, are usually central to making sure that departments' policies that involve tribal nations are, are uh, well thought out and have input from tribal leaders from across the country, right? Um, the Department of Homeland Security doesn't have that right now. And so that's something that both you set in NCAI and other tribal organizations are really pushing on. But to circle back to my first point, 
in that, you know, no one's going to know everything about tribal homeland security or emergency management off the bat, right? It, it, it's a huge field. Uh, there are folks on here uh, on this particular call, both in the audience and on this panel that have forgotten more about homeland security and emergency management than I could ever hope to know in my lifetime. But my hope as a tribal citizen and as someone who has been directly impacted by my own nation's emergency management program, that you will help, you know, take this information home, protect your people, make sure you're prepared for the next storms that are coming because the storm is always coming. Um, with that being said, Robert, if you're okay with it, I would like to highlight one of the resources that NCAI has right now for tribal nations to help jumpstart tribal emergency management preparedness, if that's okay. Or I can pause. The floor is yours. Okay, good. <laughs> Because you know, once I get on the floor, it's it's hard to take it away from me. But um, I will take two more minutes of your time to talk very briefly about um, the NCAI Disaster Preparedness Grant. So this is a good chunk of money that NCAI received from a private donor um, to help get out to Indian country. And so these disaster preparedness grants are capped at twenty thousand dollars for every tribal nation. Um, in order to apply, you either, you just have to apply on behalf of your tribe. So it can be a federally recognized tribe, it can be a state recognized tribe. No, you do not have to be a member of NCAI. So, um, you know, if, if you are looking to start your disaster uh, uh, emergency management program at your tribal nation, or you're looking to help fortify or grow your program, this grant, I would highly you know, encourage you to apply. It has to be geared toward future disasters, right? Um, so you can't say, for example, if you're hit by Hurricane Laura and you wanna fix something that Hurricane Laura messed up, you, you can't utilize the grant in that way. But for example, let's say that you know you were hit by Hurricane Laura and the power went out at your tribal hospital and you need to get backup generators for your hospital or you need to get backup generators for tribal elders' homes, right? You could buy those backup generators and start using them now if the power's still out from Hurricane Laura, right? Your applications just have to be forward looking. Um, you can also use this money to hire, um, you can't hire new staff, but you can hire a consultant. So those emergency plans that you have on hand um, or hiring, you know, there are plenty of people across Indian country um, that you could be pointed to that would love to do some consultant work for a tribal nation to help prop up your emergency uh, management department. What does that look like for your tribal nation? Do you have the internal policies that your nation, uh, you know, needs to institute in order to have all of your departments working together? COVID-19 is showcased, right? It can't just be your tribal emergency management department that's ready. It has to be all of your departments working together, right? Um, your uh, health services, your social services, um, your courts, you really need to make sure that all of your different departments within your tribal nation are ready and willing and able to work as a unit for your citizens. And so if you have a contractor that can help you figure out that process, that's what the money can be used for. So be creative, you know. I, I had a, a, a tribal uh, emergency manager ask me if they could upgrade their radio equipment uh, because, you know, lots of uh, needs in terms of communication within the tribal nation in case a, a tornado or a hurricane happens, you need to be able to communicate. You know, this type of funding is something that we have to get out the door by the end of February. Um, and so the deadline is actually February 28th. Um, we would ask tribal nations, oh, and it's a very simple application. I think it's six pages. It's not federal funding, it's private funding. So it's not uh, funding that you have to worry about all the federal strings attached to it. Um, but the only thing we do ask of tribal nations is, you know, you give us your budget, you tell us what future disaster, you know, how are you using this funding to prepare for a future disaster? And then at the end of it, uh, by June 1st, we ask that you send us, you know, a short write up and tell us, you know, what are, what are you planning to do with the money or what have you done with the money to prepare for a future disaster? So, um, you know, just as, as other people on this call have said, today is the first step utilizing these webinars. If you've never done anything in the emergency management safe, is a, is a first step and NCAI would like to help um, help you financially to help you know either fortify your tribal emergency management program or help you in getting those first steps because it, it does take folks um, internally at your nation in order to get the policies, to get the plans, um, to start preparing your nation today. So I just wanna say yako ke to everybody. Um, thank you so much for spending your time here this afternoon or rewatching this on YouTube or on the NCAI emergency management uh, webpage later. Um, NCAI is here to continue working for Indian country just as we were 76 years ago when we were created by tribal leaders and we look forward to uh, continuing to work with our federal partners uh, to make sure that tribal nations needs are met and we look forward to continuing to hear 
directly from tribal leaders to make sure that, you know, NCAI is in making the decisions. It's tribal nations that tell us what they need and where they want the federal government to go. And it is my job as a policy council to help bring those things across the line. So Yoko K. Robert, and uh, I'll turn it back over to you and Councilman Garcia to end us today. <clears throat> Thank you, Kelby. Um, before I call upon um, Joe Garcia to close us out with an invocation, um, I just want to thank everyone who joined us in the last couple of days uh, for your willingness to share, to uh, provide questions, to uh, send in information, the resources that you're aware of, and uh, working working with each other. Um, I'm my chat our relative made me reflect a while ago when he said something about, you know, that we've, we've been through uh, emergency preparedness as indigenous peoples, as nations, uh, we just call them by a different name. And each one of us, each one of our nations, you know, we were here by the grace of the creator and we'll always be here till the, creation, till the creator sees something different for us. But nevertheless, uh, we continue to survive, and we have to utilize those things that we can to protect our peoples and our communities and our governments. Um, we, each nation proceeds as they see fit, however far or however not far they want to go in this emergency preparedness uh, planning. You know, some of us were aware of that we're not supposed to be thinking about those things that are out there. They're not good. Uh, they can bring that energy that those things to be brought down upon our people if we think about those and dwell on them. But nevertheless, uh, we, you know, we're aware of those things that we have no control over and we should be prepared for them uh, for the betterment of the community and the betterment of those people who are unable to protect themselves. Uh, I'm always reminded of um, uh, Governor of uh, Acoma Pueblo, who told the story about, well, he talks about uh, contemporary times and he says, you know, my, my, my wife goes into Albuquerque on occasion and um, I always check the spare because, you know, she might have a flat and if the spare is not working, there's going to be hell to pay. You know, he's always put this in a, in, in, in a light mode, but nevertheless, it's something along the lines of what we think about and what we do on a regular basis. Most of our presenters, all of our presenters have been in situations that were detrimental to their people, but their commitment to making things better, providing relief, to doing what they can to those who needed aid, they stepped up to the plate and each one of them has shared the things that they've learned through these experiences. I'm very fortunate and I think we're all fortunate to have heard from some wonderful folks who have been on the front lines and are still on the front lines to sharing their experiences, to sharing their knowledge, the information that they've learned from these situations. So I can't express enough appreciation for what they've done, each and every one of them. And I always think about them as I go about my daily life, knowing how fortunate I am. And I always think that, I hope that all of Indian country, all of us who are here, that we will be blessed by the creator now and then the days to come. And thank you from the bottom of my heart for being here and thank you for what you do for your people. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Honorable Joe Garcia. I should unmute myself first. Thank you, Robert, for uh, allowing me this, this uh, honorable uh, task. But I want to say first thank you to all of the panelists. 
all of the participants, the people that are on the other end of their lines listening in. That's very, very good information. And so I will close with a prayer. And be out in this. And when I tell you count to no you count the man. Go over here, so go over here we move. But no, I'm told in forty hand on this. Now we get the sun get forty. No kayo marin can we won't have we could it. A boom bing on there unko and do a wink on it. Pin tie wing who would it the two namuwa ten daddy tunwa and be quill and said don't the more sun ma po wow the tunwa and be tundi and be high in the body there and but no hair with the sigi pool to kinda put it no hair with a kit or no more and boy and win a money for it. We over here, so do we all we moon. No what we saw the in bay, him but what we come I ain't bay, no the pin tied and we didn't who we and but no I'll give me being who we it I have we been I nandi who we been been sound it what in nandi that for they were no number quill no more and but okay wing or more so who I wish down yo up a fine and my guy we we for a younger to my way may I'm going to say that I'm going to be a little bit of 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 a little bit Nantabu having a mother by Kibori Kunda for here. A call came upon the great spirit again to give thanks to all of you and to all of the Indian nation, all of the people that participated, that we are blessed to be able to hold forms like this, even in the state of confusion that we sometimes see, the disasters that we see. We still have our prayers. We still have our spiritual side. We still have our camaraderie. We still have our allegiance to our tribes, to our nation, and that we must continue to invoke the spirit of our ancestors because there's power, there's energy in that. And as Robert was saying, we always need to continue to call on them because these disasters are not planned. These things that we see that hit us are not planned. So we had to deal with it. So it's not just one topic. It's the numerous, numerous of conglomerations, comprehensive approach to how we deal with all of these. We are doing it. And so I want to thank personally all of the tribal leaders that have put things in place for their own nation. And I think that we stood our ground. We continue to stand our ground. And as one of our elders has said, we will not fade away. We've been here since time immemorial and we'll continue to be here. And we got to provide the best we can to our young ones, to our unborn ones, so that we remain strong we remain united and we remain together with all due respect. And this is what I have called upon the Creator to be blessing, to give us these blessings. And so with the final word, I've also asked for your well-being, your family's well-being, your tribe's well-being, and your relationships and your relatives and the well-being of this country. So take care, be safe, be well. And I also have said, I do this with honor. I introduce myself as Sohua Owinstang. That means Mark of the Misty Lake. And I come from Okeowinge, the place of the strong people. With that, go in peace. Kundawa, be well. Thank you. Well, Back to you, Robert. Thank you, everyone. Again, stay well, stay healthy, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.